Good morning and welcome to the 15th meeting of the committee in 2019. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure they're turned to silent. Uh, agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. Does the committee agree to take item four and any consideration of draft annual reports of future meetings in private? We now move to agenda item two, which is an evidence session on local commercial radio. And we have two panels today. Our first panel um, is representatives from Ofcom. And I'd like to welcome Glenn Preston, the director for Scotland, Tony Close, the director of content standards, licensing and enforcement, and Neil Stock, head of radio and broadcast licensing policy. Welcome and thank you for coming to give evidence to us today. And I understand that Glenn Preston is going to give a brief opening statement. Uh, thanks, Kavina. Yes, yes. I, I will keep it very brief. I know you don't have lots of time this morning. Um, thanks for the invitation to discuss local commercial radio. I appreciate it's a topic that's ignited a significant amount of interest in the Scottish Parliament, and more widely since our decision to amend the relevant guidelines last year. Uh, I did write to you earlier this week ahead of the appearance just to provide some additional context to the March briefing note that we gave you ahead of the global evidence session, and I want to just take the opportunity to highlight a couple of points from that letter, if that's okay. Um, the first is to put on record my apology that we don't appear to have notified the committee of last June's consultation, which you, convener, wrote to me about. Um, you'll know we work hard to ensure that the Scottish Parliament committees, uh, a good range of Scottish Parliament committees, uh, are notified of all relevant Ofcom publications, of which there are several hundred each year. Um, on this occasion, it looks like we've fallen short, frankly, and I'm very sorry that we did that. Uh, we are reflecting on what improvements could be made to our processes to avoid the possibility of that happening again. Um, the second point I was going to emphasise is that Ofcom's work in this area, uh, which followed a detailed UK government consultation and response during 2017, uh, it has been evidence-based and carried out in accordance with our statutory remit and duties. And I have seen public questions that suggest it's not within our remit. We don't think that's correct. Um, Section 314 of the Communications Act from 2003 requires Ofcom to carry out functions relating to local commercial radio services in the manner that we in Ofcom consider is best calculated to secure these services. Uh, the committee will know the localness guidelines were last substantially revised in 2010, uh, and as you'll also be aware, the market's changed dramatically with competition coming from music streaming services as well as from other radio services, which are either not regulated, like internet radio, or are regulated less than analogue services, for example, DAB and other digital broadcast platforms. Uh, and we feel strongly that the flexibility we've introduced responds to this pace of change in the media sector and enables radio groups to put more resources into programme making and less into the bricks and mortar costs of maintaining separate local studios while simultaneously ensuring that listeners' expectations for high quality local news and other content continue to be met. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to meet with you today and we look forward to discussing these issues further with the committee. Okay. Uh, thank you very much and I, I note your comments about the letter and, uh, and the consultation. Um, I think you, you ref refer to the, the considerable uh, interest in, the, in this topic and I think one of the reasons is that many people, uh, certainly of, um, of, of my age, can remember when uh, commercial radio uh, in Scotland was extremely local and, and considerable resources were put into local content and we can already see um, that that has changed quite quite considerably um, and now we're proposing another change which will again make make, um, make content even less local and uh, that obviously has an impact on the creative economy in Scotland as well as you know the services to communities so I think that's why the, the, the um, committee is devoting considerable amount of time to this. So I wanted to go back to your localness consultation of 2018. You received 46 responses, which are published in full on your website. Now, the overwhelming majority of respondents were against your proposed changes. 35 of 46 responses disagreed with the changes, and they included MPs, businesses, members of the public, radio stations, and even your own advisory committees. In, in comparison, 11 respondents who agreed with your proposals were made up of the big players like Global Bauer, Radio Central, uh, which have sin, since been uh, 
purchased by Bauer. So can you explain why the views of the majority were completely ignored and disregarded? So I think um, in reaching the final decisions that we reached um, on, on Locanus last October, we, we had to take into account a number of uh, pieces of evidence. So obviously the responses to the consultation uh, was one of those pieces of evidence. Uh, and when we're looking at responses to consultations, we're not only looking at straight numbers, but we're also looking at what people are saying to us, uh, what arguments they're making, the weight of those arguments, the strength of those arguments, the extent to which they're uh, based on evidence. And so uh, for us, uh, for any consultations, it's never just about a straight uh, you know, numbers game. Uh, but also the responses to the consultation were one input into our final decisions, but uh, clearly the research that we had done prior to our consultation, uh, I think was also important, not least because uh, that was the main way in which we heard the voice of listeners. Uh, with the best will in the world, it's often the case that listeners don't respond to Ofcom consultations. It tends to be uh, industry and uh, other stakeholders. Um, so I think we, we took into account all of the evidence before us, including the consultation responses and the research that we'd done uh, and tried to balance all the things in all those things in reaching the decisions that we did. Yeah. I mean, can you see why people would come to the conclusion that you're actually putting more weight to the evidence by some of the big players who had a particular vested interest in further deregulation? Uh, well, I'm not sure I, I necessarily agree with that. Clearly, they are, uh, you know, commercial radio companies are the ones that are regulated to deliver these things. So clearly, their their opinion is important to us, but it's not the only opinion that's important to us. That's why we did research. That's why we consulted to seek other views. And as I say, I think we balanced all the views in, in reaching that decision. Mm. Were you given audience research paid for by parties with a vested interest, such as Global or Bauer? No, we did our own research. You did your own research. You weren't given any audience research by those companies? Correct. Right, OK. I I'm intrigued to know why there was such a rush in pushing these changes through, because DCMS have suggested legislation would be ready by 2021, but the, the industry is currently thriving. Um, commercial radio, according to Raj Rajar, made its biggest ever profit last year, 713 million. And Global themselves made a pre-tax profit of 25 million last year. So, so what's the rush for this? Do you mind if I answer that, uh, Kamina? Uh, I, don't think, I don't think I would characterise it as a rush. You're right that the industry, the sector, is doing very, very well, and we'd like it to continue to do very well. We want it to continue to be able to provide uh, a vibrant uh, radio model, commercial radio model, to listeners uh, around the nations uh, of the UK. Um, it was clearly indicated to us that the regulations in this area would ultimately be removed uh, by Parliament. That's obviously a catalyst for us thinking about whether or not the significant burdens that have been in place on commercial radio around localness were sustainable, uh, were advisable and should stay in place. It was also clear to us from the audience research that my colleagues mentioned that there was a different model of commercial radio that could be delivering for the interests of listeners, listeners who primarily uh, tune in for music or when they're looking for localness are thinking about local content not where the local content comes from they're looking for news uh, traffic travel some local information it seemed to us that it was the right time uh, to not remove the obligations but to lessen these obligations on a commercial sector that needed to compete in an increasingly complex audio environment mm -hmm. It just seems strange that you know, like you're just saying, you're looking ahead, but obviously they are they are making a considerable amount of money, and we have seen local content um, reduce uh, over the years. I mean, people can remember when, for example, Radio Clyde would have had a Scottish playlist, for example, which was obviously great for um, the creative economy and music in Scotland. Um, but that's and now the playlist, as I understand it, is, is um, set in, in Manchester, so that you have that uniformity. So it's not just about news; it's about uh, it's, just, it's, it's about the whole creative content and the decline of localness. Can I just uh -huh. um, respond to that? So I think we have actually seen some quite interesting developments in the Scottish market, and even in the last couple of years, 
which would <coughs> suggest that local dis, uh, in the way that you describe it, is not, is not quite the case. So we've seen, and you'll, and you'll hear evidence from them later today, DC Thompson invest in commercial radio in, in the last few months with the purchase of Original 106 and Kingdom, uh, with a, and uh, really at the heart of that, a commitment to maintain local passionate teams to deliver that, that type of quality radio that you're talking about. Um, and we do have you know, a, a new, other new entrants into the market in the west of Scotland, as I'm, I'm sure you'll know, Convener through Nation, for example, uh, who I think have got some pretty positive um, figures uh, coming out this morning as well, um, having taken over the licenses in that area. Um, we've got, I think, um, in the region of just under 30 local commercial FM services that we license across the whole of Scotland. Community radio is also very popular with 28 services broading, uh, broadcasting over FM at the moment with a further three applicants for licences following our most recent invitation for applicants. So I think the, the picture is actually quite positive. Mm -hmm. But in terms of your consultation, I mean, you, you, you had um, views expressed um, from, from smaller companies like Central FM, Waves Radio, Kingdom FM, Original 106, um, CIBC, the Shetland Island Broadcasting Company, Wave FM, but you didn't really seem to take what they told you on board at all. I don't... Well, as I say, I'm afraid I, I can't recall the specifics of what they said, but the, the final decisions we reached were based on the totality of the responses we had, balancing everything everyone had said to us against the research we'd done to reach a final view. I'm afraid I can't remember specifically what those stakeholders would have said, but um, the ultimate view was based on the, you know, the whole set of responses we received. Mm -hmm. But you are aware that there are numerous Scottish radio operas, operators who are not part of larger radio groups who have expressed serious concerns about the impact on local communities of deregulation. You are aware of that, you haven't? Yeah. Okay, we have a supplementary from Jamie Green. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, I have some other questions, but I'll maybe ask those later when it's my turn. But, well, okay, uh, I, I, I wanted to get to the nub of, um, I mean, we're sort of 17 minutes in and I've heard quite a lot of words around consultation and taking a balanced view and looking at this holistically. Uh, and I do appreciate that you, you, you've gone through that process and came to the conclusions you have. Uh, and, and I accept those conclusions. But I, I think, with the exception perhaps of Mr. Close, who perhaps started to touch on the reasons why you've ended up where we are, I still really cannot see the top three reasons why the deregulation had to happen uh, in the way that it has. And I think it would maybe help the committee if you were able to sell it to us a little bit better. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer that. I don't know whether I can give you a top three, but I'll give you my own view on why it was the right, or why it was the right thing to do. Uh, let's start with the fact that these are commercial businesses, commercial businesses that have to operate in a competitive environment, an environment that's changed significantly over the last 10 years with the entrance of big digital audio players into the sphere. They're not PSBs. Their primary purpose isn't to, to deliver public value in the way a public service broadcaster should, and yet, for the last 10 years and before then, they've been the subject to considerable public intervention, considerable requirements, significant cost burdens that I genuinely don't think were sustainable in the long term. And I don't think can be, the argument can be sustained that they're the best way of delivering uh, that amount of local content. I don't think it was right for us to continue to have incredibly prescriptive localness requirements that told commercial businesses exactly what programs they had to do at what time and how they had to do them. And I think it's inconsistent with the broader model of regulation. I'm also conscious that localness is delivered in lots of different ways by lots of different operators. And for me, the idea that the burden should continue to fall in the long term on commercial radio solely or primarily, it just seemed wrong. I ask you what you think the consequences of not making change in the regulatory environment would have had on the commercial radio sector? Uh, it's difficult to say, but long term, I think that the uh, significant, the pretty extensive uh, regulatory burden would have had an impact on their ability to compete, not necessarily against their immediate neighbours, their immediate rivals, but certainly against large streaming platforms. Okay, thank you. And I have a, one sm other small question. Again, I may pick up on other things that people ask later, but... Uh, I don't want to encroach on anyone else's area, but um, do you think uh, if, given that these changes inevitably will lead to 
uh, uh, reduced uh, volume of locally produced content, uh, and I don't just mean news, because content is, is about much more than on the hour news. Uh, how do you think Ofcom will seek to ensure there is a balance that people will still have access to broadcast services that will provide genuine bona fide local radio, and that could be, for example, uh, enhancing or assisting community radio? Do you mind if I start with that one, and then I might ask my colleagues if they've got anything to add? I mean, you've already touched upon uh, uh, community radio. Um, uh, but I'm also going to add uh, a note about small-scale DAB, if you, uh, if you don't mind. Um, it's important for us, I think, to think about the totality. Um, while it is, I mean, you use the term inevitable, while it is highly likely that some services will consider lowering the amount of locally made content uh, that they're producing for their commercial radio station, it doesn't mean all of them will. You may hear from some people after us who think that actually there is an opportunity here for them to increase the focus, the local focus of their commercial radio uh, services to counteract or to balance changes that other large commercial radio players uh, may have, uh, 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 the decisions that they may make. In addition, there's a great opportunity for us to explore ways of ensuring that there are a broader range of community radio services out there and they've got a simpler way, an easier way of accessing audiences. It's one of the reasons we've been so keen to press on with our small-scale DAB project uh, with the government, one of the reasons we're so pleased with the opportunities that that will provide for smaller, less well-funded, but ultra-local services to get to the audiences that they want to. Maybe the one other, uh, the one other thing that I would um, highlight is that in our Media Nations report last year, uh, and this is with a view to, as Tony said, sort of small-scale DAB and digital future, uh, Scotland was still um, slightly further behind the UK, I think about 40, uh, 46% in terms of um, changing or switching to, to DAB compared to a UK about 50 or 51, I think. Um, it looks like, although I haven't seen these in detail um, from radar figures this morning, that Scotland's jumped. Um, possibly sort of eight or nine percentage points and is now much, much closer to the UK average um, over the last 12 months or so, which would, I think, suggest we're seeing a shift uh, in the use of these uh, new technologies that can offer greater choice. I mean, that, that's all very well and good, but uh, as many members will be aware, DEB is, is good when it's good and patchy when it isn't. Uh, I mean, you can barely pick up BBC Scotland in Edinburgh. <laughs> And it's broadcast half a mile, you know, probably down the road. So, um, you know, there are, there are still issues around the technology. Uh, Scotland's a difficult place to broadcast to. FM still is the king in that respect, and, and, and indeed should be. Um, but community radio, uh, I'm glad you picked up on it, is, is facing the same challenges that commercial, small-scale commercial radio has for a long time. Um, there's, it's not a, a surprise that large commercial operators are consolidating their ad sales businesses and indeed doing regional or national advertising models as opposed to localised, whereas television has tried to go on in the other direction and, and, and localise their ads more. Community radio is, is entirely dependent on whatever funding it can get its hands on. And if the ad market is sewn up by fairly large multi-regional operators, uh, or indeed the digital market, there doesn't seem to be much money left for funding community radio. Do you think there's a role for government to play uh, in, in securing those types of local broadcasts? Um, I, I, like, I don't know whether there's a role for government to play. I think I'd start by saying that uh, my experience of community radio has been that, uh, by and large, they find innovative, creative ways of finding funding, not just funding through granted aid or through local donations, but from a different set of advertisers, from the advertisers that might be looking to advertise on local commercial radio. Um, Neil will correct me if I'm wrong or, or maybe add uh, some detail, but we and the government have already undertaken uh, and made changes in relation to community radio that makes it easier for them to seek commercial funding as a greater proportion of the funding that they get, uh, get overall in order to help them sustain themselves. Yes, I think all I'd add to that is I think, I think what small-scale DAB should allow, and we, we invited expressions of interest in this last year and we had over 700 uh, including a, a very large number from uh, all, all places in, in Scotland, both from uh, people who want to run just radio stations and people who want to operate the platforms on which those radio stations are broadcast. Uh, and so once we can press ahead with this, I think we will see uh, a huge increase in the uh, ability for 
local radio stations of all types, community, commercial, uh, to broadcast, ones that don't exist yet, or ones that are currently on FM who want to be on DAB. So I think small-scale DAB is uh, a tremendous opportunity to uh, hugely increase the amount of local content if there are broadcasters out there who want to do that and think there is a model that enables them to do it. I, I'd just say on the funding of community radio, uh, DCMS does have a community radio fund um, and we're currently waiting for them to tell us whether or not they're continuing with it and going to put more money into it for another three years, but they haven't told us that yet. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. Alexander, is, is supplementary, Alexander? You've given some evidence this morning that, that indicates the feelings behind, but in your letter, Mr. Person, you talk about proportionate changes. Do you really believe that these are proportionate changes when most of the industry believe you're ripping the heart out of it? Um, we do believe they're proportionate, and I don't think we'd recognise that most of the industry are, are doing what you've described. Um, I, I fear I might be repeating what Neil said, but I, I think when we looked at the evidence in its totality, we did think that this was uh, a reasonable and proportionate intervention, um, and um, par you know, partly because of the significant market changes that are coming and are going to be, uh, they're going to be competing against over the course of the next few years. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, we're joined by George Adam, MSP. George, do you have any uh, interest, relevant interest to declare? Apart from enjoying local commercial radio, nothing, no. Oh, it's, okay. uh, basically, can I ask a question uh, about DAB or DAB in particular? Isn't DAB quickly becoming the Betamax of radio? Uh, because basically technology is passing it by and new ways of listening to radio are uh, available there. And we've spent all this time and all this investment in DAB for basically backing the wrong horse. I don't know whether Neil would like to add something, but I, I don't know whether that's a question for us. Uh, this well, is you, you are inv basically you've been you've been telling us today that DAB yeah. is the future. So I'm saying it's the Betamax. It will be consigned to the shelf and forgotten about. Okay, I, d I, d I don't agree with the uh, analogy. FM is still king. Uh, the it is a public policy in intention to move or to increase uh, use of DAB in the UK. It has been for it has been for a while now, and it still is. But for is us, the customer not key in this? The, the listener, the customer, they, they have not made that move. They are still listening to FM. I, I think, I think when Glenn may even have uh, referred to this, I think what the data shows actually is they're listening to DAB in larger and larger numbers every year. But the most of them are still listening in FM. No, no, I think what we've seen today through the radar figures, I haven't had the chance to look at them in detail, is that that's not correct, that actually we're now over the 50% threshold. I think it's possibly up to 54 or 55% in Scotland. You're, you're right that last year, when we reported uh, in our Media Nations report, which we'll do again this summer, that in Scotland there were more people still using, using FM services, it looks like there's been a significant jump in the last 12 months to, to more people using but Technologically, I wake up in the morning and say, Alexa, play whatever radio station. That's the future, and DAB is Betamax. It's something that people will talk about in the past. I, th I think we absolutely understand that view, and actually the, I think the new RAJAR figures uh, have shown that actually um, the, the listening to radio through smart speakers is a huge growth area, uh, and I think commercial radio has recognised that uh, and has started to uh, create skills to enable uh, people to listen to their radio stations. So I think we recognise that uh, there are you know, different views around DAB and about, about its coverage. I think what the uh, DCMS review that Margot James MP announced on Monday is seeking to do is to recognise that DAB is probably going to be part of a multi-platform future for radio and no one quite knows the, you know, which part it will play, how big a part it will play. Uh, I think it's still important to the commercial radio industry and, and they may well tell you that themselves. Um, but probably as part of a much wider future of multiple platforms, as you say, online uh, and other ways of listening. And I think what this uh, wide range review that the UK government has, has kicked off is designed to see where does radio as a whole and commercial radio fit into this future of multiple means of delivering audio content, which platforms are important, where does DAB sit in that platform, will it become the Betamax, and will everyone stop listening to it? Mm -hmm. uh, in which case, you might take a different view of the future of DAB, for example. For the time being, DAB is showing extraordinary growth, and Glenn mentioned it previously, uh, you know, the amount of listening to digital as a whole, including DAB, but not only DAB, uh, jumped quite significantly in, this, in the, the most recent set of RAJAR results. And so, 
DAB ownership is now, I believe, higher in Scotland than it is in the UK as a whole. And so I think audiences are migrating to DAB. Clearly, it's been a lot more slowly than everyone would have imagined at the start. But I think, you know, there is a collective support, uh, at least among the radio industry, for DAB, but as part of a multi-platform future. Can I ask, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Rajar, uh, figures. Uh, obviously, the only licence, commercial licence, that you have uh, issued in Scotland in the past 10 years is Nation Radio Scotland. 96.3 has been a problem in the west coast of Scotland since it was in my hometown of Paisley as Q96 and moved on uh, to various other stations. Now, the figures have come in, that's been an absolute success. An absolute success. 50,000 listeners have managed to achieve, which was their first target. And uh, they, they pride themselves on the fact that they, their programming is made in Scotland, uh, their presenters are Scottish, and the whole idea is that it is Scotland's voice, back to the old days of uh, commercial radio, effectively. Now, that shows you there is an audience there for that type. But my question would be to yourselves, that's the only licence you've done in 10 years. You know, why there is scope on the bandwidth to have more, to go down an American type idea of uh, city based uh, radio stations. We have a situation where we could have more than one commercial in our nation's capital here. Why, why are we not developing this further? So, we have said we will explore uh, in our final statement that we published in March uh, whether there is scope for uh, making FM available for commercial purposes. Um, and that's an internal conversation that we've started. There are uh, arguments for, as you said, which are sort of pro-competition arguments, greater choice, more local content. Um, there are arguments against, given both the, you know, the rapid market changes that Neil, Neil described uh, and scarcity of spectrum in some areas. So you've used Edinburgh as an example where there really is a distinct lack of spectrum apart from that available for special events. Um, but we do recognise that if you take Edinburgh as an example, it has one, effectively one commercial station. So uh, that's a, a process that we're having an internal conversation about at the moment within Ofcom, particularly with our Spectrum colleagues, to look at where stuff might be available. Can I ask, finally, convener, uh, just basically, you have two streams of thought in commercial radio at the moment. You have the Bowers and Globals, which is about creating a virtual network using local licences. Uh, you then have local operators like New Wave, which is now DC Thompson, which you mentioned yourself, which DC Thompson is a media group, prides itself in its locality. You know, even in print, they have various editions of the local newspapers all over. You know, so it's a perfect fit for them because basically the stations that New Wave had are city-based stations or area-based stations. Now, these are two distinctly different models of working. Now, these other stations I've mentioned have been very successful in their own area. You talk to somebody from Aberdeen, they will talk about the Aberdeen station. Dundee, they will talk about the Dundee one. So the whole point I'm asking is, is there not a way that you should maybe be looking at that as a model and actually saying the, there is scope on the bandwidth, I don't care what you're saying. I, I am aware from people that are experts within the industry that it is available. Could you not be looking at actually doing more than just one new licence in 10 years? I, think, I mean, that's exactly what we've said we'll explore. So I think the short answer to your question is we're, we are going to look at this. Um, I think that, I mean, I should stress there are areas in Scotland where spectrum is scarce, um, but there will, be, there will be other areas where it may be possible to make a commercial viable model of the type you've described that Nation or DC Thompson want to follow where it is possible to do this. So we are going to look at it. Okay, thanks. I would just, I would just add that obviously small scale DAB is also an additional opportunity, accepting the comments others have made about. DAB, but that is another distribution platform for the likes of DC Thompson uh, and Nation Broadcasting if they wish to use it. From other uh, presenters who have thought of actually starting their own and using DAB as a platform, mm -hmm. it's very expensive for them and they can't actually do it if they were like, and you start to try and get some space on the, the local hubs. But I think the, one of the, hopefully, one of the benefits of small scale DAB is that the regime has been designed in a way to, to make it the technology that these multiplexes, which are the platforms for broadcasting are, will be used will be much lower but cost. If the public put DAB on the shelf and it becomes Betamax and it's a flood, it's a which is Which point. is clearly why anyone who's interested in operating radio stations uh, in the future needs to be thinking in a much more multi-platform way rather than focusing on one or even two platforms. But do you not accept you should be thinking that way as well as the regulator to well, try and make sure we get the best for the customers? 
Uh, yes, and as we said, I think you know our role is to facilitate where we can. And as I say, you know, Glenn has said we're we're looking at whether there is FM as a suitable platform, whether there's spectrum availability. We're trying to make uh, DAB uh, more widely available uh, as a platform. Clearly, uh, we have no input into online. Anyone can start an online radio station uh, at any time, uh, we, and we have no regulatory re regime over that at all. So, uh, I think uh, community radio. We've talked about uh, you know further opportunities for a different type of radio delivering local content. So I think from our point of view, I think when looked across the totality, what we try to do is facilitate as much as we can opportunities for people who want to run the different types of models of local radio that you're talking about. Thank you very much. Stuart McMillan. Uh, first of all, just uh, I'd like to touch upon the, uh, the letter uh, that we received from yourselves uh, today. Um, I'll be quite uh, honest with you. You've already apologised this morning. Uh, for omitting to contact uh, this committee uh, of this parliament uh, and I think we will all accept your apology but at the same time it really is quite ridiculous that the Scottish Parliament has been ignored by Ofcom and the MSPs were ignored by Ofcom uh, when you went through the, the consultation uh, last year uh, and it did, it did strike me that uh, it was a touch of arrogance uh, to actually forget to contact the, the Scottish Parliament. So, do you want me to you want me to come back on that on that point? So, I think we got it wrong, Mr. McMahon. I think we it, I don't know for definite that we didn't contact you when we published our consultation uh, in June of last year. Um, I have tried to I've tried to look back on it, and it doesn't uh, it doesn't look like we did. Um, and if that's the case, then you know it's a mistake because mm -hmm. our normal practice, as you will know. Uh, not just for this committee, but for other committees of the Scottish Parliament, is to um, share consultations uh, across the breadth of what Ofcom, uh, what Ofcom regulates. Um, we did, uh, I, I mean, we did actually share our draft and final annual plan for 1819 with this committee and with other committees, which contained uh, our proposal to be doing work in this area. But I think what what certainly I'll take from uh, this process is that when we are doing our annual planning, which will be about October, November this year, um, what we will do is specifically highlight the programme of work that's going to be of interest to the individual committees in the Scottish Parliament. I think that would be an improvement on our process. At the moment, we highlight that we've published it. We say there's things of interest, but what we will do both for this committee and particularly the Rural Economy uh, and Connectivity Committee is highlight the individual work areas that matter, we think will matter most to the committee. Okay. I, mean, I think that certainly would be helpful going forward. Um, second point, just I want to touch upon uh, the issues regarding DAB. Um, I have never uh, purchased a, a DAB radio. Uh, I never saw the need to do so. Uh, I think uh, George mentioned uh, the, the issue of the FM being, uh, being so important. Uh, I generally, had, when DAB first started out, I think that the costs uh, to purchase a radio uh, were actually very expensive. A lot cheaper now, of course, but they were very expensive. Uh, and today, um, people can just go and download an app and actually access music uh, very easily uh, and from uh, anywhere in the world. So, so I, I'm, I'm still a bit kind of struggling to fully understand why uh, still so much emphasis is to be placed and also a potential investment is still to be placed into DEB. Um. Well, as I think I said before, uh, at the moment, I think the, the radio industry itself sees DAB as an important platform as part of a broader multi-platform future. Uh, you know, commercial radio itself uh, invested in uh, extending the coverage of some of the existing DAB multiplexes uh, alongside the BBC and the UK government, but commercial radio itself did contribute to that. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think if the if this, the radio sector, the commercial radio sector, sees DAB as important, and you know there are characteristics of DAB in terms of being free at the point of use, uh, a platform that the UK radio industry uh, can control. Um, it, you know there are benefits that UK commercial radio will see. I, I wouldn't want to speak for them; they can speak for themselves. But um, certainly, from our perspective, we understand why uh, a, a terrestrial platform, a digital platform, as part of a, a multi-platform future that UK radio uh, controls and is free at the point of use for listeners, which obviously is very important. People expect radio to be free, uh, is a benefit rather than you know, online radio stations where you need to have an uh, internet connection and a, an ISP. So um, I can, we, can see, we can understand why, but as I say, I think 
And as, as Margot James said on Monday, I think the question, the broader question about the future of the radio industry is now not one specifically about is it analog or is it DAB? That is just one sub-question of a much broader set of issues around where is UK radio going, going to fit into this brave new world of all of these new platforms and all this competition? You know, what is its path for, security, for securing its future? Uh, I'd probably suggest that uh, for more investment into apps, uh, as compared to DAB, I must admit. Um, but um, my final point, uh, just on the issue regarding the, the local content, uh, I, I, I will listen to various radio channels um, throughout the day and over a weekend because I, I generally get bored very quickly listening to uh, maybe to one particular station uh, solely because the music is repetitive. Uh, and, and sadly, uh, when you go from one channel to another to another, it just seems to be the same playlist, just in a different order. Uh, so uh, I know that it's, uh, it's, a, it's commercial operations and, and they will take their own decisions from that perspective, but uh, as Joe McAlpine said earlier, um, regarding, uh, regarding it's a Bauer, uh, it seems to be that the, the playlists are set uh, elsewhere. Uh, is there not uh, um, any type of kind of recommendation uh, or suggestions that Ofcom could actually put to the, to the, uh, to the commercial radio stations? to actually have more local content uh, from the from music and from the creative side as well as the uh, as well as presenters so i don't think my colleagues from bow media behind me would thank thank ofcom for for telling them uh, what their playlist should in include no i'm sorry sorry um, sorry sorry no i'm not suggesting the playlist but i'm suggesting uh, the the level of the content even percentages of the playlist so I think with, uh, so we're moving on to sort of music format regulation now, which again is an area that uh, has been deregulated quite significantly uh, in recent years. And I think again, that is on the basis of uh, proportionate regulation and you know, which, which organizations are best placed to judge what their listeners want to hear. We think it's the radio stations themselves. And so I think where we've ended up is in a position where radio stations have the flexibility to play the music that their listeners tell them they want to hear. Now, they may not be reaching reaching you you particularly, or, or indeed other people. But I, I, you know, they will do their own research to determine what they think their listeners uh, want to hear. Uh, but in terms of music format regulation, clearly, uh, music is available everywhere now on all sorts of uh, different sources. And so, uh, again, similar to the argument on localness, I think you know there was clearly an argument to say, what is the rationale for a specific subset of the media industry, i.e. commercial radio, local commercial radio, being regulated quite prescriptively around the kind of music that they play um, in the context of the amount of competition and the fact that if you want to listen to any kind of music now, you, you can go and find it somewhere. Uh, and so I think we've, we've ended up in a position where commercial radio has maximum flexibility to a certain extent to play the kind of music. There are still some music formats that require slightly you know, outside the mainstream music, but, but not very many. But I think there's a, an absolute recognition that uh, a regulator sort of doing a top-down intervention into music on commercial radio doesn't seem appropriate in this day and age. I mean, certainly, I mean, most of the songs actually I quite like, but when you hear them day after day after day after day, <laughs> it just gets a bit repetitive. And it's, uh, sometimes it's good to actually have a, a variety uh, in a playlist. You may wish to put that to the next panel. Um, Ross Greer. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'd just like to briefly return to the issue of the consultation that the Convener uh, raised at the, the start of the session, that the number of responses that you received from smaller stations, the Kingdom FMs, this world, were, they raised their concerns. Now, I think their concerns were largely validated given uh, the first moves off uh, the back of these changes by Global. Um, if you were given the opportunity to respond to the concerns of these local stations, which obviously have that opportunity, um, what are the safeguards? What, what safeguards do you believe you have put in place to um, address the concerns that they raised during the consultation? So apologies for, for pausing. I'm, I'm trying to remember the specific concerns they, they raised because uh, obviously you know, deregulation is as much that they can take advantage of if they wish, if they don't wish. I guess from a, the point of view of those smaller stations, and again, there are people on the next panel who can speak to this more directly, you know, it, 
deregulation gives them the flexibility to choose how they wish to serve their audiences better as much as it gives flexibility to the larger groups to choose how to do that. And they will make different judgments about how they choose to do that. Uh, and we've heard already about you know, the differences between different local radio models. Uh, and so I think from our point of view, uh, you know, we understand that you know, there are some concerns between different players within commercial radio about what their competitors are doing or not doing. But I think overall, the effect of uh, the changes we made, which uh, again, I should point out, uh, confers no obligation on any uh, licensee to do anything at all. They just create flexibility. Some licensees clearly have already chosen to make changes. Others will choose not to make changes. Uh, it's entirely up to them. Um, but I think for smaller commercial radio stations, I think the important thing for them is, um, you know, what's their business model for surviving? You know, if providing lots of locally made programming and lots of local content delivers them an audience which delivers them advertisers, which let's not beat around the bush, is what keeps them on the air, um, then they will continue to do that. If they, if they decide they can't deliver a big enough audience to sell enough advertising, then they'll make different choices. But uh, I think the flexibility is what's important here. It, it takes prescriptive regulation away to give them the flexibility to choose the model they wish to follow. I take your point about deregulation in theory giving the same flexibility to everyone, but do you not recognise that inevitably in any sector, not just in, in radio, um, in any sector that flexibility is always going to be greater for the lar larger organisations who have the ability to, to be more flexible. Small, smaller uh, organisations, in this case smaller stations, are to a significant extent protected by the existing or were protected by the existing regulation. In an increasingly deregulated market, the larger competitors are always going to be more competitive. Or well, saying that uh, even in the previous era, it was true that larger groups are more able or capable of, uh, of exploiting uh, uh, the, the regulatory framework or for working effectively within the regulatory framework. I do think it's also uh, important for us to return to the fact that we haven't removed localness requirements from commercial radio. There are still, albeit at a lower level, prescriptive requir requirements for this commercial sector that impact as significantly on the larger players as they do the smaller players. With respect, Mr. Close, the, the first change that came off the back of this was Global's change to, for all intents and purposes, reduce the localness. So I accept what you're saying, that you have not removed requirements completely, but you have deregulated, you have yes. loosened those requirements, and that has resulted in a loss of localness. Is, do you not recognise though, the concern that comes primarily from these local stations that in any deregulation they are going to be disadvantaged because the larger players are always going to be more able to take advantage of a more deregulated market? Uh, I'm not going to dispute the way that they feel about it. It's clearly, their, it's clearly their view. It is an opportunity for them, though, to create an environment within which they have a brand of localness. There is an opportunity. There is, a, there is an opportunity here for more than one model, for more than one type of radio station to exist in this market, and that's what the flexibility provides. They don't have to follow suit. They can mark out a niche for themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Annabel Ewing. <clears throat> Thank you, Kibiru. Good morning. Gentlemen, um, just to, to, to go back to the issue of the consultation, if I may. Um, so uh, I understand that the Advisory Council in Scotland, which advises Ofcom, raised concerns. Uh, and the concerns raised uh, were about the research conducted by Kandar in 2015, which I think Ofcom then cited. And that research involved um, listeners' preferences for local radio. Um, and the concern raised was that it appeared that very little data was collected from Scotland. And in that regard, uh, I understand that something like 151 individuals in total uh, formed the basis of this research. And if there were to be proportionality involved, that would mean that actually that research, which played a, an important role in what Ofcom then did, would have involved about 13 uh, individuals from Scotland. Do you have any I mean, concerns I'll, about that? I'll, I'll come in first, and, and Neil or Tony might want to come in behind me. But the, uh, so there were there were actually two pieces of research. Um, so the Cantar one that you referred to uh, date back to 2015, which was qualitative and was a smaller sample, as you say. I think there were sessions from memory in 
Falkirk and Inverness, I think it was. Um, and uh, that was, so that goes back to 2015. It was actually supplemented. So the research to which we've referred uh, throughout this session is actually a populist omnibus research that we did just before the June consultation in 2018 with uh, six, I think it was over 1,600 people across the UK. Uh, the Scottish sample was, I think, 155. Yes. Uh, so it was proportionate, uh, actually probably slightly higher than the Scotland Scottish um, population share as well. And it's, it's that which forms the basis for uh, our decisions about engagement or, or listening to, to what audiences have got to, to say to us. The, quali the qualitative research is really helpful because uh, it provides a colour and depth, as you'll know, um, but the, the further research that Populist did independently for us is, is the one that's more statistically accurate. Okay, so are you saying that the Kantar, Kantar research have played no role at all in, in your subsequent... No, I'm, I'm not saying it played no role at all. I think so. It's, you're 13 it's people, not even 13 people actually across Scotland, but 13 people uh, from Falkirk and Inverness. And I've got absolutely no problem with 13 people from Falkirk and Inverness being asked about their views. That's very important. But there are other places in Scotland. Yeah, ab absolutely. And, and our wider populace survey would have caught people from other mm -hmm. bits of Scotland as well. All I said was that it's, it provides us with a depth and a knowledge and understanding of things, the qualitative research, uh, to supplement or complement the, the wider omnibus survey that we did uh, in the first half of last year. Okay. I don't really think there's much point to ask you. I mean, I think the research figures speak for themselves. Mm. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah. Just a supplementary to that, obviously we've had lots of discussions in terms of your regulatory role in television where you're increasingly understanding uh, that you know it's not just the numbers game, Scotland is a nation and uh, there are very diverse populations within that nation and so therefore conducting a survey which uh, has the, the Scottish content based in population share doesn't actually acknowledge that Scotland's a nation, a diverse nation. Um, so even this, the, the survey that you're citing as the, as the better one does it sound to me with 155 people as if it can really reflect the diversity of Scotland and the demands of the country? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I agree with that. I think we're very careful in the design of these things to make sure that we do try and make sure there's as much geographical diversity. It's not, the, it's not the only research that we do that informs this sort of stuff. So we have, for example, a news consumption survey that we do annually, which has a, uh, a wider base as well. Um, we are in the middle, you, you touched on television, we're in the middle of a, a review of BBC News Current Affairs, uh, News and Current Affairs output at the moment, where uh, we're going to be doing both our news consumption survey and qualitative stuff, I think, next week in Stornoway and Dundee, exactly to deal with those sorts yeah, of things. I'm talking about what I'm saying is that you seem to have maybe moved forward when you're looking at television in Scotland, but it seems the way that you've applied yourself to commercial radio, you've just looked at it as, you know... Scotland as a proportion of the UK population as opposed to a diverse nation of diverse communities with different needs. Well, I think the I think the I think the populist research that we did does address that point because it had a wider geographical spread where there would have been input. But I, I I hear what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Kenneth Gibson. Well, thank you very much, uh, convener. Well, earlier on, you talked about uh, innovative and creative ways of uh, finding funding with regard to um, community radio stations. But my understanding is quite a lot of them lead a kind of hand-to-mouth existence. I'm just wondering if you would prefer to see a more long-term, more stable funding model? And if so, what that would be? I, I would. Do you have one in mind, though? Well, I mean, you're, you're the regulator, so I thought you might have some ideas and as you actually work in this area and uh, you're here to ask questions about, about that. No, of course. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't have the answers for the long-term <laughs> sustainability of community radio, but I do know that they currently draw on a range of different uh, funding sources and funding models. Mm -hmm. I think the big thing for us is making it easier for them to operate at lower costs so that they can maximise the value of the funds that they get. And that's why, I don't know, people will be tired of us referencing it today. We were so keen to press ahead with small-scale DAB because it provided community radio stations with different ways of sustaining their model in the market that might very well be more cost-effective. OK. So basically, DAB is a, a less expensive way of being operating, so therefore that of itself will help long-term sustainability. Now, obviously, um, you were saying that there could be a significant number of new groups, a plethora of interest in terms of small-scale DAB, and, and that you've had something like 700 um, expressions of interest. So what are these innovative and creative ways of finding funding? C can you give us some examples in case there are any that, uh, people who are interested in taking forward these who might want to uh, look at these creative and innovative ways of funding? 
If you don't mind, I'm going to ask Neil whether or not he can talk through some of the funding models and sources <laughs> they use. So I'm afraid we haven't actually got that data. So the expressions of interest round that I uh, referred to was simply a call for anyone who was interested in operating a radio service, whether a community radio service or a commercial radio service, whether one that exists already or one that doesn't yet exist, uh, to run uh, that service on small scale DAB. So it was simply a tell us where you are and who you are. We didn't ask them a whole series of questions about how they intended to fund themselves. That will come at the time when they actually apply for a license. Uh, when we have to judge things like their ability to maintain their service. And so at the moment, I'm afraid, uh, we don't know what that looks like. Uh, they will have their own ideas, obviously, about how they think they're going to fund themselves. OK, it's just that you, the evidence you said there were creative and innovative ways of funding them. I thought we might have some examples, given of what those are. It would be helpful to the, the committee. Can I, can I be clear about what that? Because I, I use the term yes, in creative know. ways. Uh, I'm contrasting the way that <laughs> community radio currently draws funding from a variety of different areas and their lack of reliance that commercial radio has, the lack of reliance on the traditional advertising model. OK, well, th yeah, thanks yeah. for that clarification. Um, you talked about uh, there being no online regulatory control. I'm just wondering um, if that is something you would like to see. I realise it's not exactly uh, easy to do because obviously online can be from any kind of source. But can you also tell us what impact you think that might have on commercial radio going forward? Um, the growth of um, um, uh, uh, online uh, platforms. You said anyone can set them up. Mm -hmm. So what, what impact do you think it will have? Uh, what is having. Do you mind if we answer this in two parts? Of course, I'll, I. I'll answer the first if you don't mind, then I might ask Neil and Glenn whether or not they want to pick up the second. Uh, the debate about the extent to which, or if at all, uh, online audio or online audio visual <laughs> should be regulated in the UK or around the world is a hot one. It's a hot topic at the moment. Um, uh, Ofcom doesn't decide whether or not the internet gets regulated or it doesn't get regulated, but we are informing the debate in the UK by providing information on what might work and what might not work, what might provide consumers with greater protection or a greater quality of experience, and what probably couldn't be transferred from tra traditional regulatory models. Um, although the debate to date has focused on protecting people from harmful content online, I would imagine the debate will grow and continue in the UK to focus on the competitive models, the economic models, and potentially how you secure public benefit from audio and audiovisual services online as well. But that debate is at a very nascent stage at the moment. OK, the second part. For, I think we referred to it earlier on in terms of, you know, part of the rationale for the, the changes we made was the continuing increase in competition from unregulated audio services from, as you say, around the world as much as they are from the UK. So I think the impact would just be a continuing competitive impact on uh, terrestrially broadcast radio stations in the sense that, you know, these are services that can come from anywhere, that can broadcast anything they like. Um, and so they will just continue to act as increased competition, and that's probably only going to get larger and wider. Uh, and of course, for certain uh, players like Amazon, for example, you know there are there are uh, ways in which uh, the Alexa devices, you know, could be programmed in a way that so that if someone wants to listen to a certain type of music, they're directed to an Amazon service to play them that music rather than say one of the UK radio stations. And so, I think there's a you know, there is a competitive challenge for our radio industry in its place in that world, given the extent of competition and increasing. What, what kind of level of competition are we talking about? Is it likely to, do, and do you, are you monitoring the growth? Is it going to be 1%, 10%, 50%? I mean, what kind of threat is, is, is it going to um, have in terms of local uh, radio stations do you see in the future? I mean, how, how, and is this going to impact on further regulatory um, uh, considerations in the future? So uh, the answer is uh, we don't know but we're looking at that and also as part of the DCMS review that is one of the biggest questions they're looking at and I believe there's going to be some new research done possibly by Ofcom but also by other parties uh, to look into these questions you know what does the radio industry look like in 10 years time given all the increasing competition how much of a how much of a share of all of listening uh, will it have, uh, given all this increase in competition? Uh, there's, there's a certain degree of crystal ball gazing, obviously. At the mm. moment, uh, the amount of radio listening that's comprised of online listening is still relatively small, although growing quite significantly, partly through smart speaker use. Um, but it's still small compared to traditional radios, we think of it. 
Um, but clearly that is going to continue to grow over the next decade. And I think, as I, say, as I said before, that the challenge for the radio industry is, uh, you know, rather than waiting for that to happen and then see where they are in 10 years' time, this is about thinking about what, what the route looks like now to prepare them for that future rather than waiting for it to happen. Yeah, yeah, sorry, just, I was just going to add one thing uh, quickly, which is that we are committed to producing uh, the first of uh, what will be, I think, an annual report called Online Nation, uh, which will start to, to look at the evidence that exists in relation to your questions, uh, which I think we're scheduled to do something over the next three or four months. So uh, I promise I will share that one with the committee. Um, it's worth saying that I think some of the most recent data we had about uh, the impact of streaming services like Spotify and Apple Music saw, uh, accounted for about 11% of all listening in Scotland, and that, that was, I think, last year's data. We'll be due to update that again over the summer. Um, so we'll, uh, and we would only expect, as Neil said, to see that number beginning to rise. Okay, and just one last question, if I can, convener. You said at the beginning, basically, in terms of response to consultation, it's not about numbers, it's about what is being said. Is it not just also about who is saying, saying it? Because there was concern raised by the convener, and um, you know about the big players having more clout than, than others in terms of this. So is that something that you would accept? Well, I, I don't think that we. You know, so, so there's no single respondent to a consultation that who would be given kind of greater, greater voice or impact than any other. We treat all of them equally. So I hope that we wouldn't, we wouldn't do that. We try to make the decisions proportionate decisions, as we said, based on the evidence in its totality. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. I, can I just repeat the point that I made earlier, which is 35 of the 46 responses disagreed with the changes, and you did, did seem to go ahead on the basis of the responses from the big players. Yeah. Um, can I ask members, um, no members indicated they want to ask an additional question. Oh, Neil Finlay, Neil Finlay is joining us as a substitute for Claire Baker today. Um, Neil, just to be built and braces about it, do you have any relevant interest to declare? Uh, none. Right. Um, yeah, just a kind of basic question. If, if we were putting all this to the side and you were starting from scratch, um, I see some of the later, later papers are talking about reduced advertising, uh, reduced hours of listening, and um, cuts in the numbers of listeners. So if you were going back to scratch and starting from the beginning, what would you do to reverse all of that? Would you do what you're... Would you mean the model of commercial radio? Yeah. Well, Genuinely, you're going to think I'm avoiding this question, but I, I don't think it's my job to come up <laughs> with a brand new sustainable model for well, a commercial would, sector. Would you do what you're doing just now? Pardon? Would you do the same as you're doing just now? Uh, you mean well, uh, alleviate it's, regulatory burdens where I think it will help a, a sector sustain itself in, light, in the face of increasing competition? Yes, probably. <laughs> so there's three people who are involved in radio and... None of you can tell me what the sort of optimum model would be. So I think, I think if I take your question to be, if we were in the world we're in, if now, you had a blank sheet of paper and, and we had a blank sheet of paper, you, go and design the way that commercial radio should be rolled so out. I think, a, I think it's a variation on Mr. Close's answer, which is, in light of the multifarious ways in which consumers can access audio content now, local content and music content, would you? impose significant regulatory burdens on one method of delivering that, no, you probably wouldn't, would you? So is it your view that we have a, it should be an open free market approach? That's a different, a that's a just different question, obviously, because clearly we have an existing statutory framework within which we, as Ofcom, yeah. have to operate uh, until uh, yeah, the UK Parliament chooses to change it, which they haven't yet. But was asking you on the basis if we didn't, if we had that blank sheet of paper, would, you, would it be a, just a, a free for all? Would that be the best way and let the strongest survive and let the rest sink? I think it's, it's really it's a hypothetical question. Yeah, I mean, you could get from all of us. It's not, it's not one that we feel able to answer. Okay, but but there will be there will be scope for that sort of conversation in the context of the DCMS review into digital radio because I think that's, you know, they've accepted that the world has changed dramatically as Neil said earlier, not just about a shift between analogue and digital but all these IP, IP based multi-platform services um, and it, it is quite an existential question um, that they're going to have to address in so that, in so that review. So you folks contribute to that consultation? Yeah, we'll, we'll so certainly we'll, so we'll, we'll certainly input, into, we'll certainly input into, in, in conversation but we don't, we, you know, we don't know the final terms of what the scope of that is yet. 
Alexander, you indicated you wanted to come back in. Representation, is, is it not vital to maintain uh, audiences' involvement in, in the whole process and, and diversity within that process? Uh, so going back to your uh, the comment we discussed earlier, do you believe your proportionate changes will help ensure that there's diversity within the industry? Uh, yes, uh, I think they'll certainly contribute uh, to a framework where there could be greater diversity in the industry, but it really is up to the industry to take those opportunities. But you did a survey yourself that looked at uh, what, how diverse the industry was, uh, and it was quite stark. Uh, what you found there was underrepresentation for women. There was uh, uh, I apologise. Sorry. Different ethnic minorities. Uh, there were also uh, disability wasn't uh, given much scope either. So if you're not engaging with that, uh, then you, you, you're 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 in your own way you might be deflecting okay. your own audience base. Okay. Sorry. I apologise. I thought you were asking a question about a kind of diversity of model of delivering local content in different ways, not about the diversity of the workforce of commercial commercial radio. Um, I, uh, I, I don't think that there is a, I don't think there is a direct consequence of the work that we've undertaken to liberalise local niche in commercial radio on the nature of the workforce when it comes to the characteristics of those who work in uh, commercial radio. I don't know whether I could say confidently either that it would positively support mm. uh, a greater diversity. I do know that Ofcom we're doing an enormous amount of work though to hold the radio industry to account, and the TV industry as it, as it happens, to better reflect the makeup of the UK as a whole when it comes to the people that they hire, the people that they promote, the people that they retain in their organisation, and the voices that you hear on radio. But you've identified yourself that, that there's a long way to go yes. uh, for that to become the, the norm. Uh, no. uh, so, but as I say, I go back to again, do you believe that your changes will actually enhance that position? Because I would suggest that it may not enhance that position. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. That's my honest answer. It wasn't, their pri it wasn't the primary intention of making these changes. It has the potential, given that it provides commercial radio with the flexibility to do things differently, to do them in a different way. It has the potential uh, to impact positively on their, uh, the, the makeup of their workforce. But I wouldn't say hand on the heart that, that it would. No. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, just to, just to, to wrap up very quickly, what action will Ofcom take if listener choice is adversely affected by these changes? I think there's, um, I mean, there's still there's still scope for us. We keep we keep all of these sorts of policy areas under under review, um, and there's still scope for us if we feel that it isn't working to to revisit things. Um, we've we've barely started. Uh, the decisions uh, were only made in the autumn of last year, and obviously you have seen at least one uh, one player decide that they want to uh, respond to that with changes, but we haven't seen it with, with others, but we will absolutely keep an eye on this over the course of the next few months and couple of years. Okay, thank you very much for coming to give evidence to us today, and we'll briefly suspend to allow for a changeover in witnesses. Thank you.
I'd now like to welcome our next panel of witnesses. Uh, we have Graham Bryce, Group Managing Director, HITS Radio Network, and Peter Davis, the Project Manager for Bauer Media, and Adam Finlay, the Head of Radio uh, for DC Thompson Media. Um, we'll just go uh, straight to questions, and can I thank you for your written submissions? Can, can I first address Adam Finlay of uh, DC Thompson Media? Um, you, you are supportive of the proposed deregulation, but you've criticised Ofcom and DCMS because the underlying policy approach seeks to prevent existing commercial FM operators utilising any remaining FM spectrum. Uh, I wonder if you were able to elaborate um, on that and uh, what the consequences of it, and you'll have heard from the earlier section of the committee hearings that we are particularly concerned about, you know, diversity of choice for listeners. So <clears throat> I would um, <clears throat> start by saying that this is a concern that I have had for quite a number of years as we have been on a journey to greater freedom and deregulation for commercial operators across the whole of the UK and of course here in Scotland as well. Um, we, and I believe along with my fellow operators, uh, radio operators, that we should be allowed, or allowed a freer uh, framework and greater flexibility um, to deliver local radio um, and that uh, we need to take advantage of new processes and new technologies. So, so that is correct. We, you know, I have supported deregulation and the ongoing journey towards deregulation for those reasons. However, I've also long held the view um, that it needs to be balanced with a um, um, effective balance and check for how we continue to deliver local radio services into our communities across Scotland, in particular Scotland, where commercial radio enjoys a very unique relationship with the Scottish audiences which is very different from that to the south, where we don't have a, a local BBC network, we have a nation's radio, and local commercial radio plays an incredibly important role uh, across the communities of Scotland. So the absence, and it's been picked up in this morning's committee, I was delighted to see by a number of the members, uh, the absence of, 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 of competition and local commercial radio operators across Scotland is, is why we find ourselves at this point in this journey where we have been, on the one hand, pursue, pursuing deregulation and greater freedom for commercial radio operators to enjoy, but there's not been the check and balance and the proper level of competition in many markets in order to ensure that we have a rich, vibrant, diverse and healthy Scottish commercial radio landscape. And that has been my view for a number of years. It will come as no surprise to many people in the room uh, that, that I've held those views and articulated them on many occasions to Ofcom. And, and until this point, until today, um, they have been largely ignored. And I was delighted to hear today that Ofcom have decided that they're going to review um, the opportunity for commercial radio operators to enjoy some more FM spectrum, because that, in large part, is why we are now feeling this absence and this sense of loss that deregulation may bring. Right. Thank you very much for that. Um, you obviously were listening quite intently to the first evidence session with Ofcom. Uh, can I ask you what your view was on some of the um, answers that we members got when they asked about the consultation that Ofcom ran and the research that they used for that consultation? Uh, what, what I would say is that Ofcom, in terms of the, the deregulation journey, um, have listened to the commercial radio operators and pretty much um, universally, with, with one or two exceptions, um, all commercial operators supported deregulation. I accept and I acknowledge that there are a number of other contributors to the, to the consultation process who didn't share that view, and I, I've heard this morning that, that, that that's been uh, highlighted to Ofcom, but in terms of where I'm sitting, in terms of a commercial radio operator, we supported deregulation and we, and we submitted our response, which is publicly available for people to see. But where we were not listened to is where there is a need to continue to expand and allow commercial operators to expand on FM as well as DAB. The DAB opportunities um, are, 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 have, have not been under the same pressure as FM. 
but as a commercial radio operator in Scotland, where we have a very different model from Bauer, and that's fine, or global for that matter, and we respect their model and we believe that they should be freely allowed to apply their model, it will be controversial and it will attract views, but that, that's their prerogative. But we have not been afforded the same opportunity to expand our model, which is delivering local content in local communities across Scotland. And that is where the injustice and unfairness and unbalance comes from, in my opinion. Thanks. I was quite struck by the image that you painted in your, your, your written submission of the landscape in Scotland, where it's, you've got a, a, a large number of struggling community stations at one end and a tiny number of very large players at the other. I mean, I take it from what you're saying that that is a result of the regulatory framework. Is that just something that applies to Scotland or is it an issue across the UK? It's particularly acute in, in Scotland, but I would I, I believe it would also, there will be examples across the UK as well. But I, I, my, my focus is principally on Scotland and therefore, uh, you know, it's more acutely felt in, in Scotland. Um, and there are communities, I mean, I sit here as, as a representative of, of DC Thompson and its new entry into the radio landscape. But I also, um, at the same time, believe, and this would be a DC Thompson value, that we have a, a wider responsibility to ensure a rich and vibrant and diverse media landscape. And so therefore, as I sit here today, I'm also mindful of Shetland Island Broadcasting Company in, Ab in, in Shetland, obviously, Waves FM in, in Peterhead, who are equally uh, under threat and under pressure as well. So, you know, as I sit here, my mind is cast towards not just the interests of DC Thompson, but what is in the best interest of the Scottish commercial radio sector as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, before we move on, can I ask Peter Davis, you worked for Ofcom before you moved to Bauer. I, I can see you smiling. I would imagine you were e expecting this question. Um, did, did you move directly to Bauer from Ofcom? Uh, no, I, I was a, an independent consultant for, for two years. For after two I left years, Ofcom. right. Um, what impact did your working for Ofcom have in terms of your role at Bauer and also um, do you think that it helped get Bauer's um, uh, views across um, in the consultation that was run into commercial radio? Uh, well, it, it, part of my job is, is to help Bauer to, to frame its views. Uh, I, I think those views were fairly well uh, defined anyway. I, I think um, obviously uh, when you, you're sort of... Um, gamekeeper turn, turn poacher, you, you have a different perspective on, on things, mm -hmm. uh, un understandably. Um, but I'm not, having said that, I, I would hope that when I was, was at Ofcom, I did understand uh, the, the, the pressures that commercial radio was under um, and, and also that the need to, to serve audiences. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, I think it's about that, that balance. <coughs> And I think it's about the same balance uh, for Bauer as a mm -hmm. commercial operator. Yeah. I mean, our, we are a commercial business, but uh, it is in our interests to maximise audiences. That's yeah. how we make money. And, in, and to do that, we have to offer audiences the sorts of services they want to listen to. And that very much includes local content. Yeah. But of course, you have a lot less local content in these services than you used to have. And I can only speak from personal experience growing up in the west of Scotland, where Radio Clyde... Um, was very much part of the cultural landscape and, and many, many years ago I did uh, have a role as a music journalist so I was quite familiar with the Scottish music scene back um, a long time ago in the 80s and 90s and a large part of that music scene was enabled by the role of Radio Clyde giving young bands, for example, the opportunity to, to be heard and we've heard from Ofcom that um, the reason why we've now gone for these, you know, like um, very restricted play playlists set from elsewhere is, is audience demand. That's certainly not my experience in, you know, like the west of Scotland over the past 20, 30 years, you know, like there was a huge demand for local content and I think that's reflected in the fact that I believe that the football phone-in programme only Radio Clyde is the, is the one that has the highest numbers of listeners. So clearly you move away from uh, local content right across the radio station isn't necessarily what your listeners want. Well, I, I, I will d defer to my, my colleague Graham Bryce on, on, the, on the music policy. All, all I would say is that uh, if you go back to those days, and it went when Radio Clyde launched in 1973, it was the only commercial radio station in Glasgow. There are obviously now a, a, a range of stations on FM an even greater number of stations on, on DAB, and of course, as, as we've been talking about earlier, 
um, on, on the internet that there are almost countless stations. And the way that people um, access the sort of music that they, they want to listen to um, is, is much more open than it ever used to be. So you know, as Bauer, we offer a wide range of music services. It's in a different way than we used to when you had to, to cram every type of music into one radio service. These days, people can choose the type of music they want to listen to at any time of the day. So from Bauer's point of view, we offer across the UK Jazz, jazz FM, um, Planet Rock, um, KISS. Uh, we just launched a classical music service, Scala Radio, and we just launched a country music service. So, so there is a wide range of variety of music out there for people, as I say, to listen to, to at any time. Mm -hmm. In terms of, of uh, local stations, I think, I'll, as I said, I'll, I'll let Graham answer that, if I may. Yeah, well, um, I, I would um, disagree that I think that the listeners of Glasgow and the West... Um, really enjoy the output that we have from Radio Clyde and Radio Clyde, you know, our, our content policy on that station and every other station is driven by listener demand and what we think the listeners want to listen to. And whilst, you know, you may have your own personal views in it, um, you know, one third of the people of Scotland listen to one of our radio stations every week. Um, our stations in Scotland are some of the most successful radio stations in the country. We perform the BBC in every single market in which we operate. We're number one in our markets in every single area of Scotland. So. You know, we spend a lot of time ensuring that the content that we produce is what the listeners want. We research it, we research the music, we research the content, and I think we're very successful at delivering what the listeners want. And, and I think the radar and the audience um, figures prove that. Mm -hmm. Have your audience, what are your audience figures, uh, say for Radio Clyde, now compared to 20 years ago? Well, obviously they're less than they were 20 years ago because there's more competition, simple as that. So 20 years ago, Radio Clyde was the only radio station, a commercial radio station in, in the marketplace. And now with digital radio, there's probably 70 or 80 uh, mm. competitors just on traditional broadcast media. Then there's online, there's Spotify, there's you know competition <coughs> for, for listener attention from all, all sorts of angles. So mm. it would be wrong to compare the two, but what I'd say is, 20 years ago, Radio Clyde was the biggest listened to, the most listened to station in the market, and it continues to this day to be the most, most listened to station in the market. Mm. Of course, we've already heard that there isn't a great deal of diversity um, or competition, which is probably reflected in the profits of um, the commercial radio stations. But I'll, I'll move on now um, to Tavish Scott. Thank you. I wondered, uh, Mr Finley, if I could, uh, first of all, thank you for mentioning Ian Anderson and SIBC. Um, could you just explain to me, and forgive me the daft laddie question, but why do you want to expand uh, on FM? Um, FM is still where you're able to reach um, most of the audience. So there were some interesting um, facts being applied this morning at this meeting, which I found really interesting. Um, there are a number of ways in which you can measure audiences, um, you know, across the UK here in Scotland. Um, up until recently, Ofcom um, used, uh, rightly so, uh, an extremely robust Rolls-Royce methodology of measuring DAB and FM audiences in Scotland called Tech Tracker, which they will be very familiar with when it measures a number of different things. And it was regularly tracking DAB listing in Scotland at roughly between 10 and 12% behind the rest of the UK in the same technology, Tech Tracker for the UK. Uh, about two years ago, Ofcom seems to have changed its position and which method, uh, measurement methodology it's choosing to use to measure DB listening, and it now refers to RAJAR. RAJAR asks a different question about DB listening from Tech Tracker, which throws up a slightly different statistic. Mm -hmm. So I think the committee needs to be aware that, that there are different ways in which you can derive at that answer, and Raja will give you the highest possible answer. So I'd say that for a start. Okay. In, terms of, in terms of my ambition to expand on FM, it, it, it's where the big money still remains to be for Scotland. And in the short to mid-term, will continue to be where we can... Where we can say short to mid-term, what do you mean, 10 years? I, I would say certainly the next five, yeah. possibly 10, but certainly the next five. You know, at the end of the day, we as operators, and I know Barry will have the same philosophy, we need to deliver audiences to justify our advertiser results. Mm. Now, I can't do that on, on DEB because the way in which that data is collected, I don't believe to be in advertisers' or shareholders' interests at this stage, and therefore I would be advocating that we should be continue to be allowed to expand on FM, but that does not meet the interests or the policies of that of Ofcom. 
and therefore I've not been afforded those opportunities for the last 10 years and therefore my business has been frustrated because we can't continue to expand on what is the economic platform and, and DAB continues to be part of a future platform at some point may become economically viable okay. for everyone. I mean, I don't want to steal uh, George Adams' thunder, but just to, just so I understand it, um, is the view you've just suggested, pr the, the, the commercial radio view, or is, it, is it broadly across the UK? I mean, I don't just mean Scotland, but across the whole of the UK? By a number of my colleagues in yeah. commercial radio, mainly outside the major radio groups. Yeah, and, and so, so five years hence, you don't think the switch the consumer will make will be that considerable to other, I mean, apart from Spotify and all these other, uh, you know, these things here, we're, we're taking our radio on, so on and so forth. But broadly speaking, we'll still be listening to FM radio. I, I think it will, it will, I think one thing I would agree with, it will be part of a multi-platform yeah, sure, landscape. I think sure. that is true. I think, I think we need to be, um, I think where uh, Neil Stock highlighted that on a number of occasions, yeah. I, I think it, that's probably sure. right. But, but, but therefore, if that is the case, can I please expand on FM like everybody else then? Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you, so help. Okay, uh, thank you. George Adam. Vinar, good morning everyone. Uh, I can start by saying I'm a big fan of Clyde uh, and Radio Clyde in its various forms, Clyde One, because soundtrack to my life effectively. Uh, but one of the things, one of the things that, uh, although the playlist may be in uh, Manchester <laughs> now, uh, but one of the things I'd like to, uh, one of the things I'd like to ask is uh, we heard from Global and we heard the fact that they are networking virtually, using local licences to create a virtual network, a UK network. Uh, you could be in the same position because uh, you do network some of uh, your output. Uh, so what, really my question would be, what are your plans for the future? with? Because you have some major brands there in Clyde, uh, Forth, and also Murray uh, FM as well. So what, what is your future plans? Well, as you probably know, I mean, we're not, we don't make content choices based on regulation. We make content choices based on what we think the listeners want to listen to. So prior to the recent changes, we do not go to the regulatory minimum for local content at the moment because we choose in many of the stations in which we broadcast to broadcast more con local content because we think that is what the audience wants. So take Radio Clyde, for example, we still run this two-hour football phone-in show on a, on, a, on a weekdays, you know, Monday to Friday, six to six to eight. Mm -hmm. And that is way above and beyond what we need to do from a regulatory point of view, because we know that listeners love it. And if listeners love it, they're going to tune in. And if, if they tune in, potentially we can make some money off the back of that from advertising. So we make our choices based on, on what we think the listeners want. And it's not just at Radio Clyde, in Murray Firth, which you say in Inverness, we broadcast under the previous regulation way more than our, our minimum requirement. So we're not going to be driven by the regulatory framework. Our, our lobbying around the regulatory framework is really about what the future may look like. And, and the flexibility for us as a business to adapt to that future, because the future is changing as much as people would like to the world to be as it was 20 years ago. Listeners are moving their choices. They're spending more time with national commercial radio. They're spending more time with Spotify and other things. So listeners are, are, are changing the environment in which we operate. And similarly, advertisers are spending the money in different places as well. So the environment is changing around us. We want the flexibility to be able to adapt to that environment. But we're very happy with our business in Scotland, and we are a very successful business in Scotland. We've got a you know, very strong listenership, and the balance of what we do at the moment between local and, uh, and network, I think, is about right, and, and I think but we're pretty happy basically, with Basically, this is all about uh, you, your stations in particular prided themselves in your local voice. I think Clyde's sure. catch line initially was your voice in radio. Absolutely. Uh, so, but effectively, what I'm asking is, your most successful shows in Clyde are... Uh, the breakfast show, which is the norm, and the, uh, the, the super scoreboard yep. in the, uh, the evening. Now, they are so West Coast. They are so Glasgow, a uh, greater Glasgow. Sure. You know, do they not go against the idea of networking? And your most successful shows yep. are effectively, you probably, George Bowie would have to change his breakfast show if you networked him because his, yeah, we, work, his yeah. banter is effectively coming from a very Ouija-centric kind of, uh, background. Absolutely. You know, so, but is that not the future for the radio station for yourself? Uh, absolutely. You used to be 24-7. Absolutely. Uh, uh, so, 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 you know, we have absolutely no plans to change George Bowie at breakfast or Super Scoreboard because it is, the audience love it. So we have no plans to change that. All we have looked for in this legislation and the changes is the flexibility should things happen in the future that might affect our business and the flexibility for us to adapt to that change. Because unfortunately, 
the environment in which we are operating in is moving way faster than regulation can. So we cannot foresee today what the future might look like, and, and Peter's done a lot of work in our business. He might want to talk a little bit about what he thinks the future will look like in 10 years' time. You've talked to his pals in Ofcom. <laughs> <laughs> <You know. laughs> but, we don't speak anymore. <laughs> but if the, if the, I'm not convinced. <laughs> <laughs> but if the, if, the, you know, if, if the listeners still love what we do as we do, we, 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 we're going to keep those shows as they are. So I don't know, Peter, if you want to talk about how you think the, the world's going to move in, in the next 10 years. Yeah, sure. So, uh, I mean, we're in a long-term transition. So if you, if you go back to 2007, 87% of all listening across the UK was to, to AM and FM. By the end of, that, of last year, that was less than half. We think uh, our forecast, are, and, it's, and it's a fairly simple straight line extrapolation, but if you follow that trend, by 2025, we think AM and FM listening will be down to 17%. So that digital, by that point, will be 83%. Now, that doesn't mean it's all going to be DAB. Um, a lot of that, we think, is going to be delivered via IP, via the internet, um, mm -hmm. to things like voice-activated devices. So we've got to, to prepare for that world. And as I said earlier, our, our interest is in maximising our audiences, and that means going where the listeners are. And if the listeners are listening on different platforms, that's where we, we have to invest. On that, can I ask you a very quick question sure. on that actual issue? How does Bauer Radio uh, determine the rates and charging systems for their DAB multiplexes? Because we heard a lot about uh, so it could be an access for individuals to get on to the DAB multiplex. How do you actually work that? Uh, so so the, the, the prices are regulated by Ofcom. Mm -hmm. um, they, they are... It, it, it's effectively the way that we operate is is we buy our services from our Kiva, which is the, the sort of national transmitter operator. So so we pay them. We then um, effectively lease out space on on the multiplex, um, and, and we charge a regulated rate for that. Now, it is because of the way that DAB works, or at least traditional large scale DAB, it is more expensive for a small-scale operator to go on to DAB. Because if you take, uh, say, the Glasgow multiplex, I can't remember exactly how many there are, but there might be five or six transmitters required to serve Glasgow on DAB, compared to on FM, where you put one transmitter up. So even though that cost is spread amongst a number of services, it can be more expensive if you're a small operator wanting to go on, on DAB. To me, from the outside, looking in, you being in charge of the DAB multiplex, it seems a bit strange if I'm trying to set up my own radio station it's going to compete against you. It just it seems bizarre. Well, as, as I say, it, it is regulated. Uh -huh. so, so there are there are conditions in the DAB multiplex licence uh, to allow for, for fair, reasonable, non-discriminatory access. So we, we cannot um, uh, sort of treat anybody differently than the way we treat our, our own stations. Okay. Adam, just uh, on DAB, you have over the years... Uh, well, you've basically said DAB, you've, you've agreed with my ar argument earlier on that it's the Betamax of uh, radio format, but now you're applying for licences for DAB as well. Uh, why is that? Why have you had an epiphany or change of heart? Oh, OK, so um, so just on the subject of DAB, um, I, I, all I would say about the, the... The first thing I'd say is that is the pricing um, is... is <laughs> you know, Peter's right to say it's regulated to, to a point, but it's, it's, a, it's also a market-driven as I understand it, a market-driven price as well. So, you know, um, and there are deals. I mean, there are different deals out there on different multiplexes. There are some uh, of my commercial competitors enjoying incredibly low rates on particularly northern DB multiplexes. They happen not to be a borough one, actually. Um, um, and, and we're getting charged an extortionate rate, um, which is, as Peter says, m much higher than analogue transmission. So, so th there is this. There, there are f the, there are supposed free market forces at work on DB carriage, but I would suggest that where those market forces uh, carry, you know, 80, 90 percent of the multiplexes own brands, I don't know whether that really constitutes a market force or not. Frankly, so you know, DB, um, and one of the challenges to DB, and one of the frustrations for all of us, including people who own multiplexes or operators that own multiplexes, is the slow progress of DB growth. It has been slow. We got into this 20 years ago. We didn't think we'd be here in 2019 where we are. Nobody signed up for that. So it's been frustrating. Um, to answer your question specifically, you're right. Um, Original 106 um, has, has decided to go on DB for the first time. 
Um, the reason behind that is because um, about six months earlier, we saw Ofcom, uh, who um, had um, taken... Uh, down, down south, six months earlier, there'd been a station in Ipswich, uh, specifically, who had reapplied for its licence uh, and had decided not to go on DAB. And the local multiplex owner applied for that radio station's licence and won it. And I believed that we were starting to see punishment rewards being handed out, whereby if you weren't um, starting to you know, move towards you know, DAB carriage, there was a risk that you were putting your analogue licence at serious risk. Uh, now, Ofcom will vehemently deny that, clearly, but um, you know, as running a business, we can't afford to take the risk of having our licence being ripped away from us because we're not on DAB. So the main reason and the main driver for us going on DAB is to protect our FM licence from the very hard fist, frankly, of Ofcom's regulatory processes. OK, one final question. We've got Question. Yep. Uh, we've got two specific models, different models here. One is uh, a, a network uh, similar but different to the global ideal. Uh, the other one is yourself, it's working in uh, various uh, cities and local, keeping it extremely local as well. Uh, my, my question to yourselves and Bauer would be, what percentage of uh, Clyde One and Fourth One is currently networked? Uh, and uh, with yourself, uh, Adam, I would ask a similar question, how much of what your output is is locally uh, sourced and local presenters and comes from the local area? Well, f first of all, we, we would argue that, that our content is local continuously, 24-7, because just because the content is not broadcast from the location of that transmitter, we believe we still provide extremely local, relevant and engaging content and, and as we've argued throughout this whole process around deregulation, I think the place of broadcast and what comes out the speakers are two very different things. So I think we are still providing content that to the listeners is as relevant, engaging and interesting and informative from a local point of view as it has ever been. And hence why our stations are still number one in every single one of our markets. It does so happen that some of that broadcast content is not from the location in which that... Is it that, more than 50 per cent? Um, I would have to... Look, I don't know the specific numbers for each station, because each station is, in, is different. So we don't have a one-size-fits-all, as Global does. I said Clyde One, fourth one. So Clyde, Clyde One, all the, all the content from Clyde is broadcast from Glasgow, mm -hmm. because it's the network centre. So 100%, 24-7, is coming out, of that, coming out of that broadcast studio. Some of that content will also be broadcast on some other radio stations. So if you take Murray Firth, for example, Murray Firth is local 06 in the morning till 7 p.m. at night. Mm -hmm barring one hour, so daytime is completely local, and then the rest of it is networked apart from there's weekend shows that are local. If you look at Dundee, um, in Dundee we will have uh, local breakfast and drive, and the rest of it in, in, in the weekday would be, would be a network product. So it's different for every single radio station. But my concern is a lot of your fourth content for our nation's capital will be coming out of Clyde Bank. Some of it is, yeah. Some no, of it is. But, but at the end of the day, I think we're... From our perspective, the listeners love that radio station at Radio Forth as much as they've ever done. And they still tune in. It's still number one in the marketplace. One third of the population of Edinburgh listens to that radio station every week. It is hugely popular. And the listeners do not care that some of that content comes from Clyde Bank because coming at the speakers is still a radio station that they love. And that's the most important thing. It's not about whether it's broadcast from, from Edinburgh or not. It's well, about whether the model, listeners love it. Your model's different, so what, what could you add to that? So our original 106 in Aberdeen is 100% local, and we would define local as coming from its area, just to be clear about what we're defining as local. Uh, Wave FM is 100% local, coming from the Dundee area, and Kingdom FM is 100% local, coming from Fife, bar not one minute, coming from anywhere else outside of their areas. Thank you very much, Jamie. Thanks, Convener. Um, you said that the 100 percent of the Clyde content is coming out of the West Coast. Is that the case on Fourth or not? No, it's I just I just explained that um, that some of the content from on Radio Fourth or Fourth One, as it is, uh, comes out of Clyde Bank because right. some of it is networked. Yeah. So uh, is, I mean, is that, is that reflected in the listening numbers? I see that Clyde One is up; its reach is up 11 percent year on year. Clyde Two is up 
30% reach year on year. It's good numbers. Yep. But fourth is down 16 and 19% yep. respectively on one and two. Is that a reflection of the way that you schedule? Not at all. I mean, I mean, our audience figures tend to go up and down because surveys, it's, it's not an exact science. But if you look at the trend of fourth over the last 10 years, I think it's pretty much the same level of audience it had 10 years ago. So there's no, no downward trend apart from the general macro trend of less listening to local radio and more listening to national radio. So there's a macro trend here where because of more choice in the marketplace, people are obviously tuning into different radio stations because they want to hear a, a country music station or a classic music station or a rock station. So there are people are, are accessing different stations. So there's a macro trend there. But within that underlying trend, our stations in Scotland are, in general, pretty much where they were 10 years ago. So there's no change to the audience of any significance from any further networking that we've done over that time period. And uh, is, would it be the case that if, you, as, a, as a result of the changes to regulation and changes to the output, uh, the structure of your output, if that converts into a fall in audience numbers, obviously that's a worry to you, it's a fall in advertising sure. revenue, would you then seek to redress that and, and maybe reinstate some of that local content if you felt that it was having a negative effect on the network output? Absolutely, and we've already done that. So, so to give you some examples of that, we. A few years ago, some of you may remember, we networked in a, a Sunday morning show from England on, on our network in Scotland, and um, just as a trial to see if the sort of UK-wide content would work on our network. Uh, we felt as though it wasn't working. We felt as though the listeners weren't loving it as much as they were the Scottish content, so we reversed that decision. So we brought it back to Scotland and put in a Scottish show. Uh, and similarly, in the last few months, um, we've actually taken the decision to take more of the content across our stations in Scotland back to Scotland. So we had a couple of network shows in the evening on a Friday night and a Saturday night from, from England. Um, and we just felt that maybe it wasn't uh, rating as well as we thought it could do. So we've taken that show back to Scotland. So we are constantly moving the flex of the, of the local content or network content or whatever it may be based on what we think the listeners will want and how we think we can maximise ratings. So we're constantly making those decisions. And if we feel, if we feel as though we would get more audience today by broadcasting all of our stations 24-7 from the locality, we would do that because it would make commercial sense. We just don't believe it because we've done enough research and we see what the audience is, it, it does, you know, moves with their feet and we think we've got the balance about right. And I think you know, the audience numbers kind of prove that. Mm, that's very interesting. Um, can I ask about regulation? I mean, you talked about going where the audiences are and if the audiences are shifting to new forms of listening, new platforms, uh, via <clears throat> devices and streaming, consolidated streaming apps and so on. Um, these, these, all these platforms are regulated in very different ways. I mean, obviously you have a broadcast license for FM, uh, DTV and uh, DAB, digital. And, uh, and, and it is a, clearly a highly regulated market. But anyone can set up a radio station online. In fact, I've just set one up in the last hour on a very well-known streaming service. Um, it's not broadcasting anything, but if I press the button, it easily could. Um, and I can see anything on that. I can play anything within li you know, music license limitations. Um, that's a highly unregulated market, clearly. Is that a worry to you in the sense that you feel that these, ch these deregulated changes were absolutely necessary because, in fact, maybe commercial radio had been over-regulated in the past, but technology has moved much further and much faster than the regulatory environment in which it operates. I think, that, I think that's right. I mean, it's, as I said earlier, we're, we're on a long-term transition here. Uh, and, and as Ofcom said at the start, the last time the regulation changed was 10 years ago. So in, in making our argument for deregulation, we had to think about the next 10 years and what that might bring. And if in 10 years' time, it might well be that, that FM accounts for 5% of all listening, but is still highly regulated. Um, and, and that we're in that wild west, as you say, of, of everything being on the internet. I don't think that's a, well, in, in some ways it's a threat to us, but I think we also see it as an opportunity because it means we can launch uh, lots of different types of radio stations. We just have to change our approach uh, and to try and maximise audience on, on, those, on those different platforms. I think that the reason for arguing for, for deregulation is because... Um, if, as I say, in, in 10 years' time, you've, you've only got 5% on, on listening on FM, and that is, is still highly regulated, there would come a point between now and then where 
the amount of regulation on FM would mean it was no longer worthwhile to broadcast because it would be un unviable. And therefore, if, if the regulation is, is reduced now, then we can adapt gradually as we go over that next 10 years to try and maintain um, audiences on, um, and services on FM for as long as we can in a way that's viable. So it's about having that flexibility, really, to, to, to ensure that we continue to serve audiences in the best possible way. Can I just, can I just add something to that? Can I just add something to that, which is, I think one of the reasons why radio as an industry is in such good health at the moment is because of the explosion of choice for listeners. Uh, if you look at digital radio, in most markets, people have the choice of at least 100 radio stations now, and they are actively choosing those out. There's, there's choice online, as you, as you pointed out. There's streaming services and everything else that's going on there. So audio as, a, as, a, as an industry is very vibrant, and I think that's good because there's more competition, more opportunity, more places that people can set up radio stations and, and, and launch uh, uh, new services. And I think the consumers are loving that, and I think we would welcome that. You know, I think it's a great place to be. I thoroughly recommend MSB FM. It's a great station. <laughs> so my, my playlist is super. But Miss Finley, before you come in, maybe I can, you can tie this in with my question to you. I mean, obviously your model is very different. You're, you're looking at these, in many cases, struggling local stations who are still working in that, that micro environment and a local ad sales environment with very localised content, local DJs and so on. Um, do you think we still have though, a rather romantic view on, on radio in the sense that we have to protect and preserve these whilst Global, Bauer and the big boys have really nailed this networking approach um, and are managing to do both, to both have networked output using technology and localised content where the audience wants it and when the audience wants it, whilst trying to maintain, <clears throat> you, you know, your, your, your very localised individual approach to, to saving local radio stations. I mean, do you really think that can survive? So I... Um, I think that um, you know, some people are, are wedded to our romantic approach to local commercial radio. I'm not one of them. It's the only model that I am able to uh, apply because I've not been afforded the same expansion opportunities across Scotland that I've repeated on numerous occasions. And therefore, you know, we have to ensure that our um, um, offering of difference to large, networked, big, massive, music-led genre-led choice platforms that's just been articulated um, by Graham and Peter. Um, we're, we're not in that market. We can't be in that market. We can't afford to be in that market because the DEB carriage is too expensive for us. We don't own the multiplex. Bauer own many of their own multiplexes and can afford to do that. But because of the pricing structure, we're not afforded that same opportunity on DEB, nor have we been afforded the same opportunity to expand on FM by Ofcom. So where do we go? That's the heart of where this debate lies. That is why we're sat here today thinking, why are we suddenly feeling an absence and a, and a drain of, of localness? That is the heart of what, where, where this all lies. So it's the broadcast costs. It's, 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 the la it's the broadcast costs, in particular the DEB costs, and the lack of expansion on FM to commercial operators, including Bauer, including Global. They've not been afforded the same opportunity to expand either. Bauer applied for the Glasgow licence that was talked about earlier, that's now arrived at Nation Radio. That was an appalling decision by Ofcom, where they awarded that to. Both Bauer and ourselves expressed serious concern about how that licence was awarded. It lasted, well, it didn't even last five minutes. It didn't even get on air before it was sold. Highly predictable. We have a letter, I have a letter written to Ofcom saying, wow, that was a big surprise. Everybody was surprised by it. Nobody thought it was, everybody by most people's measure thought that the winning applicant by far had the weakest application and the weakest model and it didn't even get to air before it was sold. This is not a regulator who has been best placed to take best decisions about the future of Scottish commercial radio. And that is why we're sat here today feeling this sense of loss and absence and lack of opportunity to expand on, on commercial radio. Fact. Thanks very much. Um, bringing Annabelle you in. Uh, thank you. Peter. <clears throat> well, just picking up that point, so would you say that Ofcom has outgrown its usefulness? I wouldn't say that. <clears throat> I wouldn't say that because at the same time, uh, as has been alluded to in this meeting, in this committee, that there is a, a, at the same time um, you know, a large number of digital disruptors arriving in our markets. And, you know, both Bauer and ourselves and Global are commercial businesses. We pay taxes, we make profits, we employ people. 
we contribute to the local economy significantly. And, you know, there is still a degree of protection that is required across all radio operators. The problem that I have had is I've not been afforded the same protection as everybody else. I do not have the same relationship that the other big players enjoy with Ofcom. And therefore, m operations like mine, and there are numerous examples up and down the UK, have not been afforded the same opportunity to expand and grow our business as we believe we could. I believe we could populate Inverness, Murray, Edinburgh, Dundee. Actually, Edinburgh's got capacity for probably two or three new licenses, frankly. But we have not been afforded those opportunities. Meanwhile, the larger groups have been given huge opportunity to expand at a rate of knots on DEB. And I actually don't think that that's necessarily wrong. What is wrong is why I have not been afforded those same opportunities. That is the unfairness. No, I hear light and clear what you're saying. I, and uh, in terms of the current structure, it is not easy to see. And, and indeed, uh, Ofcom's approach, for example, to this committee, where, which I had to apologise for this morning publicly, um, it's, it's difficult to see in the short term how we can ensure that Ofcom uh, takes its role in Scotland more seriously and, in fact, understands what is going on in Scotland. Uh, so, you know, we will obviously reflect on the evidence we've received uh, this morning. Um, turning to a broader issue and involving uh, the other members of the panel, um, you, you've all stressed um, that you do, you know, you provide what your listeners want. OK, fair enough. Uh, your commercial station, so you would have to get that right in terms of your advertising and so on. But how do you actually then seek to gauge, just as a matter of curiosity, how would you seek to gauge what your listeners want? Presumably you don't adopt the Ofcom 13 people in Falkirk and Inverness approach, or I, I don't know what, what you do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've obviously got quite robust research uh, studies that we continuously take on a quarterly basis. Um, so we, you know, our, our studies really involve two two different types. One is music research. So we do music research. So somebody mentioned earlier about our playlist decisions. We research our music in Scotland. So uh, whilst the playlist decision may be taken across the network as a whole, uh, the Scottish voices are a major contributor to that. So their their tastes and interests are taken into account clearly. And then we do we just do straight audience research. So we ask our listeners what list, what radio stations they like. You know, why do they like them? What presenters they like? You know. Uh, is it getting better? Is it getting worse? You know, do they like particular shows? So we do extensive research on that all, all continuously. So we, you know, it's it, it's it's our lifeblood. If we get the content decisions wrong and the listenership goes down, you know, it's a it's a bad commercial place for us to be. So it, it's it's at the core of what we do. Uh, and in that regard, I mean, on the changes to breakfast uh, shows and so forth, has that engendered any particular uh, reaction? Um, you mean in terms of what Global has announced? Yes. Well, you know, there's clearly been some uh, listener reaction from their particular listeners. Um, but I have to say, uh, you know, um, whenever you make a change in radio, whatever that change is, listeners don't like it. And it doesn't matter what that change is, because, you know, the great thing about radio is people are really passionate about it. And they, and they love people have got, you know, real affinity and, and affection and passion for their local radio station or their national radio station for that matter. So if you make any changes, whatever those changes are, you know, there's always going to be a, a kind of sense of loss from people who passionately love what you had before. So there's clearly been some reaction from, from the listeners around that. We only have to wait and see what happens because at the end of the day, if the listeners don't like the content that they're producing now, they will not listen to the radio station and it'll end up in their audience numbers. So only time will tell whether that's the right decision for them or not. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Stuart McMillan. Thank you. Um, uh, on the issue of Ofcom, obviously we heard later on regarding it was, it was 10 years ago uh, when they last looked at uh, regulation. Do you think that uh, any time there's going to be any type of regulatory uh, change that uh, it should maybe be kind of every five years to try to keep uh, as up to date as possible with, uh, with uh, the, the current climate? What I, would, what I would say, um, just going back to that last uh, relaxation of rules, is Scotland was significantly disadvantaged back then, by the way, because Scotland was not a defined area. So just, just for a point of information, even back then, Scotland was being disadvantaged in that framework of deregulation because that, that deregulation uh, was, was, was centred around defining areas and allowed stations to enjoy certain economies of scale. Scotland was not one of them, by the way. So Scotland was disadvantaged, in my opinion, back then, 10 years ago. 
it was about to be disadvantaged again. I know some people on the committee have opposing views to that, but both Bauer and ourselves put forward submissions about the greatest, widest possible level of deregulation that should be afforded to us both, and we strongly believe in that, I think. Um, but we also, certainly DC Thompson certainly believe that that should be balanced with the continued expansion and rollout of FM commercial radio. So I've repeated that on a number of occasions. In terms of future deregulation, um, I think that this would, this, this, at this stage, this has been fairly wide sweeping deregulation and you can see Global have already made the decision as to how they want to take advantage of that. Um, and that's their prerogative and it is fairly radical and you know it certainly uh, could not be a business model further away from DC Thompson's business model both newspapers print digital and now broadcasting so you know we will continue to su support deregulation whenever that opportunity comes around but we'll also continue to apply our local radio philosophy because that's the belief about how we generate local audiences and create connectivity with local advertisers and create the career paths for future presenters, which have just been significantly diminished in all of this as well. So, you know, we, 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 you know DC Thompson have arrived at, at Scottish Commercial Radio with a huge appetite to contribute and add diversity and enrich this broadcast landscape. And I would only ask that those that are listening afford everybody, including Byron Global, the opportunity to continue to expand on all platforms, not just one. I think the pace of change uh, is accelerating, so I would hope it's not going to be another 10 years before Ofcom have another look at this. I think, as, as Convena said at, at the beginning, uh, DCMS uh, announced that, uh, following their consultation in 2017, that they intended to bring forward legislation. Uh, and let's hope there's a, a good, robust debate around that legislation, but that could be in 2021, who knows. So I, I would hope that Ofcom will keep this under under constant review, really, and, and if changes are needed to regulation, whatever they may be, uh, you know, and it, it could be, for instance, introducing new regulation on, on DAB if, if, if that is seen as the best way forward to protect uh, protect localness. Who, who knows? But um, yeah, I would hope they keep it under review. Mr. Bruce. No, I, I think I'm. Peter's really speaking on behalf of Bar, so yeah, I think I think exactly the same. I think you know the pace of change is fast. Um, the more times we can review the regulatory framework to adapt to the current environment, the better, for, from our point of view. Okay. Uh, I mean, that's actually quite an interesting point, I feel, that um, usually uh, people actually ask for some type of certainty and some type of stability when it comes to regulation, uh, but yourselves are, are, are arguing for the exact opposite because of the pace of change. Well, principally because um, the direction of travel in the regulation is deregulation. <laughs> mm -hmm. So... Um, we've long argued that, that radio has been overregulated, um, and and I think history would provide that was uh, true. It's been overregulated. So uh, I think over time we are seeing some deregulation. We would always vote for more deregulation, as as Adam at DC Thompson would as well. So we still think radio has probably too onerous a regulatory environment. Uh, so anything that uh, can accelerate that in, in an environment where we're competing against people who are completely unregulated, <laughs> that that's the force. That we're playing with and uh, just my final question just in terms of the notwithstanding those points uh, are there any other areas of support that you think the industry actually needs the answer by, by saying you know we need the opportunity to expand further on fm and and there needs to be a more meaningful commercial clear path to a DAB future for stations like Shetland Island Broadcasting Company, who have virtually no future in DAB potentially, you know, uh, you know, there needs to be small-scale DAB, which was cited this morning, is not a solution to commercial radio for the future of DAB. It's just not economical. It's too small, and will repeat many of the challenges that small-scale FM has been suffering from the last 20 years. So small-scale DAB, which seems to be uh, hailed as some sort of you know silver bullet by Ofcom that this is going to somehow solve the gap that exists between commercial operators and a future to DAB is, again, like many of their policies, fundamentally wrong for Scotland, particularly. So this, what I would, argue, what I would suggest is we need to be afforded the same expansion opportunities on FM that community radio has enjoyed and that, sh and that sh all operators should be afforded that opportunity. And there needs to be a massive rethink on the DAB pricing and... Um, 
um, access structure if we're going to have Scotland playing its part in a bigger DAB future? Because as it's currently structured, it will not work unless you're part of one of the two larger radio groups. I, I, think, I think there's also a question about uh, that, that very long term, or maybe not very long term, it might be quite sort of medium term, where um, the vast majority of listening is to IP delivered services over the internet. Uh, I think we, we have a concern that if that is the case, uh, there is no protection there to ensure that uh, UK broadcasters, uh, whether that's TV or, or radio, have proper access to those services. If, if those platforms, um, thinking particularly of 5G, end up being controlled by, uh, by the like, likes of, of Google, maybe, or, 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 um, or Apple, or, or, or the mobile phone operators who don't have any interest at all in, in the content that's being broadcast, that we could be uh, effectively closed out of those platforms or at least charged exorbitant rates for them. So I, I think as part of the review um, that, that DCMS have announced, uh, we would be looking for um, UK government to think about ways that they might protect um, the access of UK broadcasters to those platforms in the future in the interests of, of UK and Scottish cultural diversity. Okay. Thank you very much. Neil Finlay. Uh, a question, Mr uh, Finlay. Fine, fine name, of course. Uh, um, but, um, uh, is, it seems to be, uh, you're saying that deregulation uh, and competition is what you, what you want to see. Do you think that drives um, quality um, and success, ultimately business success for yourself? I think, it, I think it drives quality and business success uh, for everybody. I think it also offers choice locally, which uh, is at risk because of the lack of, of, of uh, expansion on, on FM in particular. Um, and, and it would also ensure that the larger <laughs> operators weren't so, weren't so keen to vacate local markets because where they enjoy virtually a monopolistic situation, what's the incentive to stay in the market and deliver a local radio station when there's no choice anyway? So if deregulation, if deregulation and competition uh, across different platforms drives quality and success, you're also in the newsprint um, media. What was the circulation of the Sunday Post, say, 10, 20 years ago, or the Beano, 10, 20 years ago? How many copies would you sell? Uh, I don't have the information to hand, if I'm being honest, and but how, I suspect how, it's less. And how many do you sell now? Uh, it'll be less, I would imagine. Be hugely less. Yes. So therefore, it does not just follow that competition and multi media platforms drive success, or I would argue quality. If we look at US TV, we have zillions of channels, most of them crap, in my opinion, most of them spewing out rubbish. So therefore, I don't understand that argument that it just says, you know, liberalise everything, let, let's have a free for all, and we'll drive success, we'll drive up quality, and uh, the future will all be bright. I, I, I understand and acknowledge that. I think with the newspaper sector and the print sector parallel to that point about content and quality and, and drive, there's been a fundamental change in consumer um, activity across the piece. So, you know, where, um, and in particular the DC Thompson titles, for example, who have enjoyed, um, you know, higher than the rest of the, the, rest of the UK sector, um, you know, circulation numbers. So in other words, the rate of decline in, in the print sector is, is, is ever, everybody's in that yeah. situation. DC Thompson are faring the best in Scotland in that, in that fight. And that is because of the quality of the content and the connectivity they have to their readers and now listeners, if you, if you want to throw radio into that mix as well. But I think the underlying and the underpinning um, f failure for the print industry has been the speed with which it hasn't changed onto these new growth platforms. Conversely, and Graham and, 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 and Peter are right, radio has actually enjoyed that journey quite successfully. You know, internet and, um, and um, digital and app listening has not been the enemy of, of radio, it has been the friend of radio. 
um, you know, it's created more access channels and more access points for people to enjoy their favourite radio station. We just, I would just like them to have more, for, you know, more local radio stations. Um, but I think Peter's also right in the point that he just made a minute ago. We need to still ensure that there is protection and that we're not thrown under the bus alongside the rest of the swamp of internet and webcasters that are out in, in, in the world. Because at the end of the day, everybody in this room, I would imagine, wants a rich cultural, meaningful landscape for commercial radio. And that, that, is, that is what we need to try to protect in, in amongst all of this. So there's a couple of items there that, that will ensure that. But Bowers, I think it was Bowers' paper, tells us that listeners, listener numbers are down, people are listening less, and um, commercial activity from advertising is down as well. Is that not the case? Um, well, I think our paper said that local listening to local commercial radio is mm -hmm. down, and that's because we said earlier that because of the diversity of choice now that people have. Mm -hmm. So, in, in the old days, 20 years ago, um, the only radio station people could listen to in Glasgow would be Clyde One, or Radio Clyde as it was then. Now they can access 70 or 80 radio stations. So inevitably, people are choosing to listen to that great variety of choice that they can now get, whether that be classical music or country music or rock music or speech. A lot of people there uh, listen to LBC or, or talk sport or talk radio and all these other services. So clearly there's a fragmentation of audience amongst the channels. But in totality, radio is, has got as much listening now as it had 20 years ago in terms of access, in terms of numbers, in terms of hours listened to. So it's just the fact that people are listening to less local commercial radio and more national commercial radio. Where there is a look... That's not necessarily the case. So, for example, in Aberdeen, Original 106 has just posted record high audience figures. It's 100% local and not on DAB. So, so Graham's right, where, where there is no choice and there is only one local station and there's a plethora of new DAB genre stations coming in, their diversification is underway. But where you have alternative local radio choice, it doesn't always play out that way. And Original has just posted a record audience figure yesterday. So, ultimately... The the way we want to go is like Mr. Mr. Green, that we all have our individual radio stations, we're all quite happy, and nobody makes any money. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> you will not be making any, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, Kenneth Gibson, please. Uh, thank you. Convener, I mean, the more I listen to the evidence session today, the more I wish we had actually taken the evidence from you first and Ofcom second, frankly, and I would hope that if we have a similar session in the future, that's the way we'll do it, because there's a lot of questions I think that have been yeah. generated from the evidence that you've given, particularly the direct contrast between what you've said about DAB and uh, FM. So, for example, Mr. Uh, Mr. Finlay, I, I, I've been getting a sneaking suspicion that you favour F FM over DAB. I don't know how that's crept in this morning, but it <laughs> seems to have done so. And, and, and I do have real concerns about what you're saying, that when... When Ofcom, and I, I don't know, I, I think a, a fairly, um, maybe hostile is not the word for it, but certainly a kind of defensive evidence session they gave compared to the more open one that I believe your panel has given. They uh, talked about DAB, you know, the plethora of interest. They were obviously incapable of uh, explaining the innovative and creative ways it would be funded that they... They, 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 that they said could happen, but uh, no examples were given. But they, um, they said that uh, there was a clear future for commercial radio through DAB, and yet you've specifically talked about, for example, Shetland uh, Radio, which obviously have great interest in Mr Scott, uh, would really struggle on that. How do you feel we can change things, actually? How Ofcom can change things so that FM is not, as you said, over-regulated uh, uh, um, relative, uh, um, relative to DAB, so that we do get a balance, so that you are and other uh, um, uh, local commercial radio stations can grow and thrive? So, t uh, two answers to that. One is we need to continue the rollout of DAB across the whole of Scotland, so no communities or any rural area is left disadvantaged by not having access to DAB. So there are a number of areas across Scotland where DAB cannot be heard at all, and that needs to continue to be expanded out so there's no community left disadvantaged. That's number one. Number two is that the pricing mechanism of DAB carriage has to be proportionate to what the radio station can afford, not a one-size-fits-all. So, for example, where you've got a community station or a small local commercial station, wherever that, might, wherever that may be, um, it, it, the, the pricing for DAB access 
has to in some way be proportionate to what it can afford. And that's not currently the pricing model of DEB in Scotland or anywhere else in the UK. So those would be the two fundamental things that I would advocate could change significantly our journey towards a bigger DEB future. Yes, but at the same time, you're saying that that DEB future should not be at the expense of FM. Correct. I mean, I personally only ever listen on FM, so I'm completely in, in support of your point of view, and I don't want to see FM uh, weakened. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, at the beginning of your evidence, you talked about RAJAR, and um, the, 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 the clear um, steer I got from your evidence was that it seems to be heavily biased towards DAP, DAB. And would I be wrong in saying that your views is Ofcom are trying to create almost a stampede towards DAB, whereby listeners won't really have much choice uh, other than DAB in the future? I mean, Mr Davis talked about only 17% FM uh, uh, within a few years, so 48%, uh, I believe, in Scotland at the moment, which seems quite a drastic reduction. How, how do you feel about that? And Mr Davis, if you could respond to, and Mr Bryce, if you so wish. So so, so my, my personal experience with Ofcom the last <coughs> 10 years is that they have looked at in pursuing all policies that lead to a DAB future. Um, and, and that has been evidenced through you know, the lack of FM licensing and the continued rollout of, of DAB across the UK. So Ofcom have been wedded to a policy of a future DAB. And, and sorry to interject there, but what, what do you feel is their motivation for that? Um, at the heart of it, I think it lay at the, at the very beginning of the journey, which started 20 years ago, mm -hmm. um, you know, the belief that, that we needed more choice in, in commercial radio across the UK and DEB affords more stations to use less bandwidth in the technology. So I think the motivation behind it way back in the day was to genuinely dra drive choice and so forth. But the frustrating journey the last 20 years, and it's been picked up by a number of people in, in the room, is that DEB hasn't enjoyed the success that we would have all hoped the last 20 years. It has been slow for all sorts of reasons. I think mentioned earlier on about the price of a DEB radio when it first launched into the market. There are these black spots, and, and, and actually you still continue to have FM fitted as standard in 95% of all cars. You know, we have a uh, unfortunately, in the UK, a, a, a body called Digital Radio UK, which is effectively a PR machine for exclusively DAB, effectively, uh, and they put out all sorts of headlines that people grab onto, and they, one of their favourite headlines is 98% of all cars now come standard with DAB. That's true, but they still have FM. <laughs> so you're right, there's still going to be a landscape for, for both, and we shouldn't be disadvantaging one. And my, to answer your question specifically, my own experiences with Ofcom is that they've been wedded to a future DEB policy, which only recently has begun to flex with this approach that we heard this morning about a multi-platform future. That's, that's new, this is new language for Ofcom, in my experience. Okay. Can I just um, <coughs> say first, just to add some balance to the, the DEB and FM debate, that you know, we, we truly believe that DAB is not the Betamax of, of radio and that DAB is the future broadcast one-to-many platform for radio as an industry. So there are many ways in which you can re receive a radio signal, be it 5G, be it on an app, be it through Wi-Fi, but there is only two technologies that are broadcast technologies that are one-to-many, that are hugely efficient, that are robust and that you can listen to in any environment, and that is... FM, AM, analog, and, and DEB broadcast technology. So, you know, whilst FM is a great technology, we truly believe that, that from a broadcast platform point of view, DEB is the future. It's going to be the future as part of a multi-platform future, but it is the broadcast platform of the future. And just to give you an idea about, we talk about numbers, the, the facts are that over half of listening in the UK to all radio is now digital, over half. For our business... So for Bauer across the whole of the UK, 70%, 70% of all listening to our radio services is digital. And, uh, uh, Mr Bryce, I mean, Mr Finlay pointed out that, you know, there's only been like one FM licence been awarded in the 10 years. So sure, surely if the, the big push is towards DAB, um, that's going to be inevitable, not necessarily because of consumer choice, but because they don't have uh, as much choice. And I mean, if we're going to uh, maximise audiences, surely... 
FM should also be allowed to thrive as well as people just being pushed down the road of the... Uh, sure, of Peter, I'm not going to get my car changed to, to, to take DAB. I'm, you know, I'll just happily sit with FM for as long as it exists. <laughs> sure. I, I mean, Peter may be able to explain this better than I can, <laughs> but, but across the whole of the UK in totality, there's virtually no FM spectrum left. So it's not like... There's loads of FM spectrum that could be could be advertised. There are pockets in Scotland where there are opportunities, but as the UK as a whole, there is no FM spectrum left, and, and Peter will be way closer said. to this than I am. Yeah. Sorry, Mr. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Mr. Davis. Sorry. I, no, I, I think I think as, as Graham said, you know, th there are pockets where there is FM frequency available. But it, it, again, if you if you look at Glasgow, for example, where you can get 50, 60, 70 stations on DAB, there is no way you would ever fit that number of stations onto FM. So the amount of choice that, that's available on DAB is, is, is potentially far, far greater. Um, and for us as a commercial business, that's where we see we can expand audiences. That doesn't mean we don't believe in, in FM. We, you know, we still obviously invest in our FM businesses. We've just bought 46 FM licenses in England and Wales. So of course we still believe in, in FM. Um, but it's, it's about going to where we think the audiences are to, to, so that we can maximise the commercial opportunities. But I, but I don't think anyone is suggesting that, you know, that there can be 50, 60 stations on FM necessarily in Glasgow, but you know, five or six might be okay. Edinburgh only having one, surely. I mean, one would have thought there's still room for FM growth is a point I'm trying to make if we have to... Um, but it's not, the, just, I, not, just on that point, that it's not true that Edinburgh only has one. So, so Edinburgh has Capital Radio... It's got heart. It's got fourth. So there's three commercial licences. They may not be local, as in just for Edinburgh, but there are local FM licences that are broadcast in that marketplace. You know. Mr. Finlay, uh, that's an interesting description of local. <laughs> <laughs> I like the two same local. Okay. Thank you very much, Mark. Give me up. Thank you very much to our second panel today, and um, we're now going to um, go into private session. Thank you very much for coming.